Welcome and good morning, everyone. Um, welcome to day two of our today virtual NIH Pathways to Prevention Workshop on identifying risks and interventions to optimize postpartum health. We're really happy that you're here with us today. My name is Kate Winsack, and I'm a coordinator of this Pathways to Prevention Workshop. Um, and I will serve as a host today to help us guide through the agenda, presentations, and discussions. So um, I want to first take this opportunity to thank uh, in advance our workshop co-sponsors uh, and planning team members from the NIH Office of Research on Women's Health, the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute, the Eunice Kenny Shriver National Institute of Child Health and Human Development, and the National Institute on Minority Health and Health Disparities. Uh, the scientific leads from those four offices at NIH have, have been working tirelessly over the past two years or so to bring this workshop to, to fruition, so we really are appreciative of them. I uh, also want to thank our independent panel who will be overseeing the workshop today, and especially our panel chair, Dr. Corinna Davidson. Um, they are charged with writing the panel report at the end of the workshop. Um, so they have a large job. We want to thank, you, thank them, also our workshop speakers, and everyone who is attending today. Um, let me cover a couple of housekeeping items before I turn it over to Dr. Davidson. So, uh, Catherine, if you could move to the next slide. These are redundant from yesterday, but we're expecting a, um, a number of new attendees today, so I'm just going to go through them quickly. So, you can access the workshop agenda webpage uh, to find the following information, the agenda, final agenda, bios of our panel and speakers. Uh, the draft systematic evidence review from the New University of Minnesota Evidence-Based Practice Center, which is available for public comment. Um, and then in early 2023, you can find on that website the panel report and the recordings from today's workshop. Um, next page, please. So I want to remind everybody of the Office of Disease Prevention event guidelines, which can be the full guidelines can be found on our website. Um, a lot of this information is um, self-explanatory, but it is important. To, um, to remind everybody about the importance of upholding professional and educational purposes of meetings by respecting the rights, views, privacy, safety, and dignity of all people. Um, so that inv involves um, professionalism, consideration, and respect in your speech and your actions and the information that you put in the chat. Um, and, and we um, respectfully request that you from and refrain from engaging in behavior that's inappropriate list in those bottom three bullets there. If you experience any violation of these guidelines, please email ODP at the email listed at the bottom. Next slide, please. Okay, if you would like to comment and ask questions today from members of our audience, which we strongly encourage, um, use the WebEx chat pod, pod and send a question to everyone, it says everyone in the chat pod. You can also email NIH uh, P2P staff at the address there and join our conversation on Twitter. Next slide. And if you have technical difficulties, you can put a note in the WebEx chat pod to all panelists or email uh, NIHP2P staff. Next slide. And if you would like to access the closed captions, which are available today, go to the three um, dots at the bottom right hand of your screen and open the multimedia viewer. Next slide, please. Zooming in on content, which you can do from your own desktop. Uh, Web WebEx makes it difficult. So we want to make sure we point out the little plus and minus uh, buttons right at the very top of your screen um, underneath the thumbnail sketches. You can make content smaller and larger there. Next slide, please. Okay, other opportunities to comment, not just today in the chat pod, but, um, but in the future on um, the draft systematic evidence review prepared by the Minnesota Evidence-Based Practice Center, and I just mentioned that a minute ago, and the link is up on the ODP website. We can also put it in the chat. Uh, it is available for public comment through December 4th, so we encourage everyone uh, to go ahead and review and comment if you would like the, as we explained yesterday, the, um, this draft systematic evidence re review was commissioned by ODP specifically for this workshop and you will hear part of the results of it presented today. Um, and then, of course, you can review and comment on the independent panel's draft report from this workshop once it's written. Uh, we expect in January. Uh, it will summarize the workshop and provide recommendations for future research and also will be available on the ODP website. Next slide, please. Okay, please uh, co uh, complete the post-workshop survey 
If you're able to, at the end of each workshop day, a survey will be posted in the chat and you will also receive an email from WebEx with it. The survey is different for every day, so if you attended yesterday, you'll receive a different email today. It only takes a couple minutes to complete, and we actually do really pour through the responses in ODP before we hold on our next P2P, so it's really helpful to us. Next slide. Okay, and then lastly, we have day three of our workshop tomorrow, so please plan on join us if you, joining us if you would like. Again, we'll start at 11 a.m. Eastern. We will cover the rest of key question two, which is listed there. And then we will also have a uh, round table on cardiovascular risks and interventions. Registration is required for each workshop day. So if you haven't, please register for day three. And I think that might be it for me. Let next slide. Okay, I think that's yeah, the last that's slide. It. Okay, thank you. So I will now uh, turn it over to Dr. Corinna Davidson, our workshop and panel chair to do a welcome for day two. So oh, thank you, Kate, and welcome everyone. We're very excited to have you all here and to um, continue on in our exciting roundtables, our continuation of the evidence review for key question, key question one, um, and the start of um, uh, talking about how to um, tackle key question two. Um, I would like to join Kate in thanking all of our NIH partners, and I'd like to specifically call out uh, the Office of Disease Prevention uh, for their coordination and leadership of this important uh, uh, P2P topic. Um, just a brief reminder from yesterday, I know many of you who are on the call today were there yesterday, but we do have time scheduled for um, questions. We welcome your questions. Please uh, put them in the chat. Uh, we will be asking the independent panel members first for their questions and comments and ensuring that those get answered since they have to write up the report of these findings. Um, and then we'll be turning to the audience questions. And so with that, I'd like to turn it over to the first round table. Good morning. I'm Dr. Pamela Stratton. I'm going to be moderating this roundtable. Uh, and I would like to introduce Dr. Ebony Carter. Uh, she is from the Washington University. And she will be speaking next. Good morning, everyone. Are my slides coming? Thanks so much for inviting me to present on one potential strategy for patient-centered care that we're taking in St. Louis through the Elevate Collaborative, which stands for Elevating Voices, Addressing Depression, Toxic Stress, and Equity Through Group Prenatal Care. Next slide, please. I have no financial disclosures. Next slide. But I do have a shared work disclosure. Um, because this work is not my own. Uh, we have a um, collaborative that spans the entire I-70 corridor across Missouri from St. Louis over to our friends in Kansas City who are doing this work. And most importantly, our patients turned partners who you see listed in the upper um, corner of the screen. Next slide. So our story begins in the summer of 2016 when Melissa Tapey, my fellow obstetrician and the chief medical officer at our largest community health center in St. Louis, called all of us who were doing group prenatal care or centering pregnancy in the city of St. Louis together to try to address the terrible health inequities in our city. So what you see here is a heat map of the preterm birth rates in our city with red and hitting the highest rates, more than 15%, and the lighter the yellow, the lower the rates are. So to orient you, the Mississippi River is this little blue line that you see over to the east. And if you look a mile to my uh, west, the preterm birth rates are among the best in the world. At a mile to my north, the preterm birth rates are among the worst in the world. Um, and even if you know nothing about my city, I bet you can take an educated guess about who lives to my west and who lives to my north, because racial inequities in this country are pervasive no matter where you live. So in our first meeting, we agreed on a lot of things. First, we needed to take a transdisciplinary approach. It couldn't just be the OBs in the room, um, and that we needed to be um, like across the entire city. We were historically competitors, but that wasn't going to work. We had to get over that stuff. We had to address the, the terrible reproductive health inequities in our city and that patients needed to be part of the work. And that first meeting was literally the only 
um, meeting we have ever had where patients were not at the table. The other thing that was that we realized quickly is the mental health needs of our patient population were overwhelming. So 80% of our patients had a past or present mental health diagnosis, usually depression or anxiety. And if you had Missouri Medicaid, ability to access mental health services was almost non-existent. But we also had a lot of areas of collaboration and consensus that were needed. So what was the role of research? Research was kind of a bad word in those early days because researchers had come into our communities, extracted the value that they needed, never to be seen again. And I say that as a researcher. So we had to, to really grapple with that. And then how do we address the root causes of the inequities in our city? And then what does accountability to community voice look like? So our early work, um, if you can go to the next slide, please, was really guided by this quote from Reverend Starsky Wilson, who was the co-chair for Ferguson Commission. Now, you remember, this is 2016. So Michael Brown had been murdered just eight miles north of where I'm currently sitting in Ferguson, Missouri, just before this. And so Reverend Wilson says that programs are short-term interventions that create temporary improvements in the wake of challenges. Policies, on the other hand, are covenants we collectively choose to live by as articulated in legislation and regulation. They inform our socially accepted mores and ethics. And so we knew that we needed to do more than create a, a nice program, that whatever we needed did needed to be systematic and embedded in policy. Next slide, please. And so our work was guided by the Ferguson Commission, and we really took to heart looking at things through a racial equity lens and asking the question, who is this recommendation benefiting? How are different racial and ethnic groups affected by it? And then what, and probably more importantly, who is missing from this discussion so that we can actually move the needle. Now, I can't tell you a seven year story in 10 minutes. What you're getting today is kind of the trailer version, but the people who did this work can tell it so much better than I ever could. Sharon Phillips was one of our early Elevate moms who then became a true partner in this work. And so a few years in when patients were like, I don't wanna do Elevate, it takes too long. I don't want people in my business. Sharon was like, we need to tell this story a little bit better. And she wanted to create a video. And so she put this entire thing together herself. And so we're gonna take a quick break. You're gonna see a five minute video about the work of Elevate in the words of the people who did it, led by Sharon, you'll hear her voice as well. And then I'll come back to you to conclude with some solutions. So let's go ahead and watch the video. I want you to hear my voice. I want you to hear my voice. I want you to hear my voice. Elevate stands for addressing depression, toxic stress, and equity through group prenatal care. So through Elevate, you have this group prenatal care program that is one-stop shopping. You come and you get all of your prenatal care in a group setting with women of a similar gestational age. But embedded in that, you also get mental health needs addressed. What's different about Elevate, it offers a different experience and an approach to overall holistic health um, for black and brown birthing people. Trauma-informed care, and that's something that you don't always get when you go into a 15-minute doctor's appointment. Having somebody to talk to is the most important thing. Baby's health, um, your health during pregnancy, making sure everything is going appropriately. I don't think a lot of us are aware about mental health especially the back community. Mental health is a part of the whole person that needs care, just like your blood pressure would need care. We all need someone to talk to about the things that we're thinking or we may be going through. And tell me more into myself and the baby as well as other mothers, comparing notes and stuff, and just to know that if someone else out there will possibly the same problems as I have. Looking at the needs of black and brown moms living in, for the most part, the inner city of St. Louis, group prenatal care is an opportunity for patients and providers to come together and talk about um, pregnancy-related topics in a group setting. So we want the environment to be super welcoming for everybody who comes. It is a group that you also have the support, the voice, the experience of the women, kind of also melding in the medical and behavioral health trauma health piece and I think that's powerful. My mental health it was okay but at the same time I basically was screaming out for attention I'm doing this again and not ready at the moment. My parents passed away when I was 21. My daughter she doesn't know that yet but I'm worried about when that conversation comes. If you're not mentally sound how can you really give birth to a baby and expect to be okay? 
we can't have healthy babies without healthy moms, and moms can't be healthy if we're not also th viewing their mental health. Trauma is the emotional response that each of us have when something terrible happens to us. And it's the kind of thing that sometimes we don't speak of. It's not always a physical. It's definitely mental, sometimes environmental. I always thought it was about death or you know, losing something that was close. And I found out in class there were other ways of trauma. It'd just be anything that just take a toll on you, I would say. A big way I would define trauma are things that are present in our city and in our country, like racism. And it affects our health, especially during pregnancy. It can really cause problems if we don't manage it. Race is something that needs to be considered. It, it influences uh, people. It influences how we think about people, how we approach people. It also means recognizing that there may be parts of our healthcare system that make her feel like she's at risk of being traumatized again. The community voice aspect of that has been so powerful. It has really changed my approach to my other work. Really took it as a time to really think about the connection between racial equity and healthcare and how that can eventually make an impact on infant mortality and preterm birth and low birth weights. The patients really had the most important voice at the table. Elevate has reframed my thinking to be much more patient-centered. As a patient, it became a partner. And offering my community voice has helped shape health care, especially to black and brown birthing people. It changed the way I approach my, my whole research. Patients need more of a voice when we're thinking about the interventions that we want to provide. Break down those medical barriers, uh, social determinants, it's a health that they may be experiencing. It's amazing to see how far it's come in, in five years with the help of so many community partners. It has opened me up in so many different ways. I can actually, you know, help other people with the information that I know. Being a part of this initiative has helped me and my family to grow stronger together. It gives you some hope. Like, it gives you hope that things can get better. Join. You don't even have to say anything. It's join. We need you to come join. This is what we all need need as a community, whether you're black, white, Asian, it does not matter. I want you to hear my voice. I hear your voice. I hear your voice. I'm listening and I hear your voice. I hear your voice. Escucho a tu voz. I hear your voice. Thank you. We can pick up on the next slide. And so this is a continuous process, and I don't proclaim to have all the answers, but are we listening? And are we hearing the voices of our patients? So in those early days of Elevate, a curriculum committee of patients, OBs, midwives, nurses, social workers, psychologists, we had everybody at the table we could find, came together to create the Elevate curriculum that embedded a behavioral health intervention into group prenatal care. And it was imbued with beautiful representative and inclusive images, trauma-informed care, and actively being anti-racist. And then we decided to try it out. So this is a diagram of our pilot study at Athenia, which is the largest community health center in St. Louis, Barnes Jewish, where I work, and St. Mary's, which is the academic center of St. Louis University Medical School. And patients were either in traditional care, elevate group care, or standard group prenatal care. And we followed them to see what happened. Next slide. Now, this was just a, a feasibility study. Like, can, can we actually do this? We weren't powered to see anything. So imagine our surprise when we looked at the patients in individual care and their preterm birth rate was the ridiculous rate we see in the city, 18%. And of the patients in Elevate, not a single patient had a preterm birth. And I can poke all kinds of holes in the methodology of what we did in this, this small pilot trial, but it suggested that maybe there was a there there. Next slide. We also looked at postpartum outcomes. And so, you know, while only 50% of patients in individual care came back to their postpartum visit, over 80% of the patients in Elevate attended their postpartum visit. So after much trust and relationship building, we applied for an R01 about three and a half years after working together um, that was funded. And so we're now halfway through the recruitment pandemic and all of that R01. So I don't have more postpartum outcomes to share with you, but now I wanna turn our attention to the larger group care literature and how it can inform our work to promote health equity and postpartum outcomes. Next slide. To take a step back, this is a meta-analysis that we published a few years ago looking at preterm birth rates for group care versus individual care. And it was really disappointing because it actually showed there was no difference, which has come out to bear in some of the other studies since. But then we did a subgroup analysis of the Black patients in all of the studies, the high quality studies, and we found there was a 45% risk reduction in preterm birth rates among Black patients. 
And so my working hypothesis is that if you do group care a mile to my west, people are going to enjoy it. It's fun. It's a great way to get your care, but they were going to do well anyway. I think that group care works for those among us who are most likely to have the worst outcomes. Next slide. We're also doing group care in other high risk groups, such as patients with diabetes. So this is another randomized trial that we did. Um, and we looked at patients who had gestational diabetes and any of the obstetricians who are on know that you need to get a six week test after pregnancy to see, do you have type two diabetes? Um, or, you know, can you get engaged in risk reduction strategies so that type two diabetes is not a foregone conclusion? But in our patient population, people never get it. Only 20% of our patients with diabetes actually get that test. But when you randomize patients to group, 70% of them came back. So almost four times as likely to come back for that care. Next slide. And one final study that I wanna share, this one is in press now, was in 55,000 patients who were um, living in St. Louis city or county and delivered over a seven year period. And we wanted to look at, you know, does participating in centering pregnancy, the most commonly practiced form of group care in this country, does it change birth spacing? Because we know that if you have brief interpregnancy intervals, then your outcomes end up being much worse for that pregnancy. So, so does centering do anything about that? And so what we found is during the study period, people in centering were actually more likely to have another pregnancy. Um, but if you looked at the pregnancy spacing, it actually was much better because people who participated in group care or centering pregnancy were less likely to have a brief interpregnancy interval less than six months and less than or equal to 12 months. And I think that's probably because there's a lot more time for education and support in this form of care. Next slide. So I'm just gonna be honest, for group care and postpartum outcomes, that the literature is really limited. I think that we can generally say that there's probably increased uptake of LARC in terms of contraception because we spend the time to say, what is your vision for your family and how can we achieve that? I think there's a lower rate of brief interpregnancy intervals and for patients with gestational diabetes, much more likely to come back. But much of the rest of the literature is equivocal and I think we just have more work to do. Next slide. So while the data around postpartum outcomes are relatively limited because the studies just haven't been done, I think the data are better when it comes to group as a potential means to promote health equity. But why? And I used to think it was the, the education and the support and all of these other things that we do, but this is a qualitative study that looked at shared medical appointments. This is what we call it outside of pregnancy and looked like what are the mechanisms by which it's working? And so I've listed them all here and highlighted the ones I think are working on the patients in aqua and the ones for the clinicians in yellow. And notice that half of the things that you see here are on the clinician. Friendships, because you're actually working with another clinician to do the groups and collegiality and learning and then adequate time. I don't have six people in my waiting room. When I'm doing a group, that group has my undivided attention and it's just for them. Next slide. So that leads me to a piece, an opinion piece that we wrote last year. And the, the piece argues that part of the reason why we have failed to meaningfully move the needle when it comes to reproductive health equity in this country is because we're looking at the wrong people and we're asking the wrong questions. We act like it's all about the individual and the behavior. And if we just manipulate the behavior in this way, no, people live in larger systems and structures. And until we look at those and invest our time and energy in those, we will have missed the mark. And so with Elevate, our R01 is Elevate Patients. It's looking at the patient and the patient outcomes. I'm really excited that in September, we received an R21 that's called Elevate Clinicians, because I think the clinicians are just as important. And we wondered early on, you know, can, if you participate in Elevate, if you do our anti-racism training and our trauma-informed care training, are you less biased? Are you less racist in the way that you show up? And let's be real, we're probably not gonna undo a lifetime of accumulated racism and bias with the training. But what if we don't have to? What if by spending time doing the training, and then a longitudinal experience with a patient over a course of six to seven months of these groups for two hours every other week, seeing the social determinants of health at play in a patient's life, seeing that their partner is unkind to them or they have housing insecurity or food insecurity. When you see those things, does it increase your empathy? And is that enough to change the way that we're showing up? And so we're studying that actively now through Elevate. So hopefully I'll have more details in a few years for you. Next slide. I wanna thank all of our funders because we have had peaks and valleys in funding throughout the year, so incredibly grateful. Next slide. And to my research team, this work would not be possible without them. And last not but not least on the final slide, to our Elevate Patients Turn partners, the entire collaborative, this work is all because of them. Um, and so thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to present our work. 
Thank you so much, Dr. Carter. You have helped us elevate the voice of patients and families and provide ideas for patient-centered strategies for care. We are next going to um, turn our attention to Mr. Johnson, who will be talking um, about how maternal morbidity and mortality have a lasting effect on families as alongside every individual who is severely affected or lost during pregnancy is the family unit. Mr. Johnson, please join us. Good morning, everybody. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Stratton. Um, thank you for having me. It's an honor to be here this morning. Um, first of all, I just want to just give kudos to the entire team for putting together in a wonderful um, just uh, panel that's going to be extremely impactful. Um, before I say anything, I have to really acknowledge all the other participants that you're going to hear um, from after me. And I want to acknowledge the strength and the courage that it takes to share their personal trauma. And um, I just want to just send them just, um, you know, just love this morning because I know some of the people that you're going to hear with this is their first time sharing it publicly. So with that being said, I'm Charles Johnson the fourth. Uh, I am a father, um, an advocate. I call myself a dad advocate, and I'm going to be brief and kind of talk to you about my experience and what's brought me here. So I was fortunate enough to meet a woman that absolutely changed my life. And so when we talk about my wife Kira, we're talking about someone that was truly sunshine personified. Um, I always wanted to be a father, and we welcomed our first son in 2014. And we always talked about how amazing it would be to have back-to-back -back boys, right? Boys that were close in age, that would grow up, kind of built-in best friends. And so we found out that we were expecting our second son, Langston, in April of 2016. And so on April 12th of 2016, we walked into Cedar sinai Medical Center in Los Angeles, where we expected to be the happiest day of our lives and walked right into a nightmare. Um, it's important to understand that Kira was not only in good health, she was in exceptional health. Um, all signs pointed to her and our new baby being both extremely healthy. Uh, we had a emergency C-section without any complications for our first birth. And so we were, we had a scheduled C-section at our doctor's recommendation. So um, in the interest of time, I'll share with you that what took place the afternoon of April 12th uh, six and a half years later is still extremely difficult for me to comprehend and put my mind around. Um, our son was born perfectly healthy, um, 10 fingers, 10 toes, and we were on top of the world. Shortly after that, everything took a turn for the worse. Kira was back in recovery, and I actually noticed that there was blood in her Foley catheter. I brought it to the attention of the doctors and the nurses at Cedar sinai They came in, they examined her. Um, and they assessed her physically. Uh, they ran tests and they said they would do a CT scan that's supposed to perform stat. Over the course of the next 10 hours, they allowed Kira to bleed internally while myself and my family begged and pleaded for the hospital and the staff to take action. Um, they said that there was a CT scan coming that never came. They talked about taking her back to surgery they never did anything. Um, and by the time they finally took her back to surgery, it was far too late. When they took my wife back to surgery, there were three liters of blood in her abdomen. From where she was allowed to bleed and suffer internally for more than 10 hours and she coded immediately and they weren't allowed to save her. Um, and I wanted to share with you how I got here, but more importantly, um, as was mentioned in the intro, I want to talk to you about the lasting impact of maternal mortality on families. And I know that you all have heard a lot about the statistics and the data. And the data is horrible and it's shameful and it deserves attention. But the reason I'm here is what I wanted you all to understand is that there is no data that can quantify what it's like to tell an 18 month old that his mother is never coming home. There is no matrix, right? Or graph that can compute how difficult it is 
to explain to a child that will never know his mother just how amazing she was. And so we have work to do. And that's why I'm honored to be here standing in solidarity with all of you as we lock arms and join forces and pool our resources and our gifts to fight to make sure that our country is a better, safer place for mothers and babies. Um, I've had the, you know, and I'll share with you, and I usually have my slides and all my stuff, but I'll share with you, um, reach out with that. So these are my boys. This is Charles and Langston, and they are now six and eight years old. Um, and they're amazing. They're thriving. They are brilliant. They are good at everything that they do, and they get all that from their mom. Um, but no matter how hard I try, no matter how over the top the birthday parties are, no matter how many soccer teams I coach, no matter how obnoxiously I involved I am in their lives, there is nothing that can replace a mother's love. And the manner in which we treat, support, and care for our mothers and our babies is the most telling measurement of our society. And by those means, we are failing our mothers and our babies in this country. Mothers and babies in our country deserve so much better. And as long as there's breath in my body, I'm going to fight to make sure that they get it. Thank you so much for your time. Wow. Thank you, Mr. Johnson, for sharing your really important perspective. I sort of feel like I have to pause a minute. Um, I, I next am going to introduce my colleague um, who is going to share her patient story as someone who suffered um, some complications postpartum. Um, and I would like to introduce Dr. Banditini uh, to share her story. Thank you for having me and um, I'd, I'd actually like to acknowledge uh, Mr. Johnson as well for uh, sharing his powerful story. And so, yes, I'm, I'm here today and not as a, a cardiologist. I'm, I'm here because I have a lived experience of having had a complication post delivery, you know, an SMM is, if you will, severe maternal mor morbidity. Um, this has been over a decade, but I, I had a overall, it was a pretty straightforward uh, pregnancy. I had maybe slightly elevated blood pressures towards the end, but nothing that required treatment. Um, it was like I said, my first and at 41 weeks, they said, okay, we need to induce you. And so um, it was a scheduled induction. I was in hospital and uh, after 13 hours of sitting around waiting, and then I got uh, five hours of what they called a practice pushing, <laughs> which didn't seem to help. And so I ended up getting an urgent C-section though because of a failure to progress and, and loss of fetal heart tones, which maybe was positional. And um, thankfully though, the, the rest of the hospital stay was, uh, was uh, uneventful. My son was born. He only spent um, one a night in the NICU. We, we were thrilled. It was a happy time, which is what it's supposed to be. And uh, so I actually went home, even despite being C-section, I went home within two days. And, you know, as new moms are wont to be, I, I went about showing off my baby and, uh, you know, I had friends saying, you know, he seemed kind of wobbly and pale, but I'm like, yeah, had a C-section, who wouldn't be a little wobbly, right? <laughs> Um, but uh, four days after delivery, I, I kind of started to say, well, you know, it seems like the amount of bleeding I'm having seems more than normal, but, but who knows what, what is normal, right? But I, I came to this conclusion at, at one in the morning and, and, you know, I couldn't sleep and I, 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 I knew something was wrong and I felt dizzy, but because I didn't want to bug the on-call OB, I decided to wait. <laughs> I said, well, let's let the OB sleep. And so I, I waited five hours and um, I'm not saying my judgment was the best, but I, I did wait and I said, okay, 6 a.m. They should be up by now, right? And so I give a call and, and I explain my concerns about the bleeding. And I said, you know, how I'm, I'm dizzy and I've got tingling in my fingers. And I was told that, oh, it's probably nothing. And you're probably just anxious and hyperventilating. But if, if you're really worried, you can come in to be seen. So then I get off the phone and after hearing that, I, I kind of doubted myself. I'm like, oh, maybe I'm making uh, too much of a deal about this. But uh, shortly afterwards, I kind of just 
slid down to the ground and my husband called 911. And so uh, they bring me in and it ends up my hemoglobin was six, which is half of what it should be. Um, they gave me uh, um, some transfusions and then they went in and they did a, a DNC of my uterus. So they went in looking for source of bleeding, cleaning things out. And then after that, they said, okay, everything looks good. It's, it's all fixed. So I go home and unfortunately it was uh, again within uh, two days, I passed what was a large clot. And I think it seems as though in, in hindsight, thinking through that clot was probably tamponading uh, my uterus. It was keeping the ble bleeding from being worse than it could have been. And, and, but after that, the flood work started and I was on the ground in a pool of blood. And so um, my husband, he called 911. I'm taken to the ER again and my blood pressure is really low. And they've got three huge, you know, IVs in me and they're running fluids, they're running blood. Uh, you know, and it's funny the things you remember, even with the low blood pressure, things were kind of fuzzy, but I remember uh, it wasn't cross-matched blood and I'm thinking, whoa. And so they're, you know, doing universal donor blood and, and they're just trying to keep my blood pressure from tanking. Um, and, and this is even after I'd received transfusions just two days before, right? Uh, but my, my blood counts were like a third of what they should have been. So my husband, he tells me the thing that scared him the most was he's watching the on-call OB and the ER doctor and the ER nurse, and they're examining me and they have this look of horror and fear. You never want your doctor to look scared, right? I was scared, he was scared, we were all scared. And I, I see in the corner of my eye, my, my baby, and I'm like, oh my God, this is it. I'm not gonna be around. Um, but then they came and they said, well, we, we, we think we can stop the bleeding, but we're gonna need to do a hysterectomy. It didn't make me feel better. I was still scared. And even though the future seemed really far away, I'm like, but we wanna have more kids. And, and is this really the only solution? So my blood pressure, while not good, had at least wasn't, wasn't continuing to drop. I said, can I just have one moment to talk to my husband? And my, my parents have, uh, were long passed away, but I, I had my cousin, uh, husband called my sister. You know, you think you're gonna die. You wanna talk to your big sister. And she's also a physician. And, and she says to me, which I, I kick my socks and I'm like, I guess I should have thought of this. She said, do they have an interventional radiologist? And so I jumped on that. And, I'm, and so my husband and I was asked him, we said, do you have an interventional radiologist? Because we said, well, if he can go in, do an angiogram, if there's something focal, maybe a hysterectomy could be avoided or maybe something more definitive, non-invasively could be done. And, and I have to say, the team was a little taken aback that we're asking, you know, uh, for, for an interventional radiologist. We said, could you at least call? They, we were lucky that the hospital had the capability. So they called, he was in house, he'd just finished a procedure. And so they whisked me off to uh, the uh, radiology suite. And, you know, as a cardiologist, I've done like a thousand angiograms. You lie on the table and you go in through the femoral artery with catheters to look at the coronary arteries. It's the same thing when you're looking at the uterine arteries, but it's very weird to be the patient watching them do all of this, right? Um, but I could see on that monitor, you know, he gets in there, he injects the dye, and sure enough, spurt, 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 and there's a focal uh, bleed. And so he goes in, he injects a synthetic foam, and he stops the bleeding. And so between that, you know, that was my miracle. Between that, uh, I had received a lot of blood, four units. I stayed one night in the ICU, and I got discharged the next day. So, you know, my husband and I now have three boys. We ended up naming our youngest child. We gave him the interventionalist middle name, uh, first name as his middle name. And, you know, without him, we wouldn't have had um, our two other kids. So when I think about this, you know, the lessons learned, I, I grew up in the Midwest in Illinois. I can't say that I come from a disadvantaged background. I'm educated, um, but bad things happen and they can happen to anyone. I also think that women are stoics and, and we don't want to be a pain. We don't want to inconvenience people. So a lot of times we'll, we'll ignore things like when I waited, you know, five hours to tell uh, the doctor the first time around my bleeding. I also think that, you know, in pregnancy in this post-pregnancy state, it's so filled with a lot of messiness. There's a lot of abnormal and it's hard to know how abnormal is abnormal enough to call your doctor or, um, you know, for the doctor, how do you know when you can reassure your patient versus you need to pay extra attention? I also think, you know, I, I was fortunate. I was able to advocate for myself because I have this medical background, right? Other women don't necessarily have that opportunity, um, but to be able to say, ask and say, are you positive there isn't another option? I'll say back then, I think doing interventional radiology to stop bleeding was not as common. And so the, there was a lot of, of luck involved. Interventional radiology isn't available at smaller hospitals, right? Having the doctor in house, things lined up for me. 
so I, I get how lucky I was, um, which ultimately ended up with a positive outcome, right? I'm here, I'm here today, I have my kids. So I'm thankful, but I, I admit I have survivor's guilt, um, rational or not. And uh, I think that's my story. So thanks for listening to me. Thank you so much, Dr. Bandatini, for, for sharing your story with us. Um, you have shown us how bad things can happen to anyone. And it's, it's really important for all of us to reflect on that because uh, it's through the use of your voice that it seems like you were able to navigate a really great path forward. Now, I'd, I'd like to next turn to Ms. Husky. Unfortunately, she is not able to join us um, on the, you know, virtually like this, but she was able to pre-record her comments for us. Um, and I, I'd like to have that video shown now. Thank you. Hello, my name is Sheree Husky. I'm very happy to be speaking today to all of you, just to let you know my unique story of my experience with postpartum morbidity. I was 27 years old when all of this happened to me. I was pregnant with my third baby and what happened was very rare and the day that I experienced all of this, I was going to visit my mother and my father with my two older children and the new baby. He was a week old. My birth and labor and delivery was totally normal. I was going to visit my parents who live outside of our main town of Tuba City, Arizona, where I'm from. Uh, there's a lot of unpaved roads, many people who don't have running water or electricity, and my parents were one of them at the time. Uh, I went there to go just spend time with my parents, let them see the baby, have a great day, have breakfast. And when I arrived, there was nobody home in the house. They were around on other parts of our land. It's very rural there. We, have, uh, we had sheep at the time that my dad was taking care of. And so we waited in the living room, saw breakfast on the table. Um, I went to the restroom and immediately I just felt gushing. And blood was just literally starting to drip out of my body. So at the time we had a bucket inside of the toilet, toilet bowl and the bucket was just starting to fill and fill and fill. And by then I was panicking. I didn't want to scare my children. And thankfully I finally heard my mom walk in the door and I screamed for her. She came in and saw what was going on. She started panicking as well. We hurry up and loaded up my kids in the car and she took me to the hospital. On the way to the hospital, we stopped down the road where I was living. Um, with my husband and my three kids. Um, he wasn't home at the time. And I dropped my babies off with my mother-in-law. I did not know that that was going to be the last time that I saw them for a while. And it still bothers me because I could have possibly had not come back to them. And I went to the hospital. I was still in shock. And um, I got to the hospital. My sister finally answered and she met us at the ER. My mom told her to go in with me just so she could, you know, watch what everybody was doing. She knew all about it. And they began uh, giving me blood transfusions. I didn't know what I was signing away when they had walked me through the paperwork that I had to sign. I was barely conscious to even sign it. But Dr. White here explained to me that, um, worst case scenario that she was going to have to do a hysterectomy. I signed the paper and I remember 
falling asleep, losing consciousness, consciousness for a little while. And I just remember everything for me was slowing down while everybody was in a panic running around me. Um, I woke up in ICU probably almost a week later. And my sister was there with me and my uncle and my aunt had come in to visit me. I didn't know what happened. And um, I had so many people come visit me from my family. I didn't realize what they had been through that whole time. I just focused on trying to get better and seeing my baby again. But the reason they had to keep me there for so long was because nobody scrubbed in. So I had tons of antibiotics just pumping through me. And I finally got better. Everybody was really happy I was okay. And that was kind of like the end of it. Nobody really talked to me about what had happened. Um, so I felt like, you know, maybe it wasn't that big of a deal. And I mean, it was scary in the beginning, but I was just happy I was better. And I was gonna finally see my baby. During that time, my family all pitched in. They were taking care of my kids. My newborn was being passed around to about three different houses and he ended up getting RSV. So the night I got out of the hospital, he was being um, rushed to the ER by me and his dad because he could, he was having difficulty breathing. He was there for a few days and he just progressively got worse. He, they intubated him and eventually had to fly him out to Flagstaff Medical Center, which is an hour away. And he, ended up staying there for a month. I immediately left home with a big cut in my stomach. And um, I didn't, it, I just totally forgot about myself and went to go be with him. After he came home, I think we were all so happy and thankful that everything was fine. I kind of just went on with life. Um, about a year after that, after he got a little bit older, I sunk into really bad depression. I did, wasn't sure what it was exactly that caused it, but I, I was really bad. My daughter, she wasn't even 10 yet and she was helping me so much because sometimes I just couldn't get out of bed. Um, also at the time I was um, suffering from different types of abuse. Um, I'm also a victim of domestic violence. So during that time, I really wasn't big on focusing on my pain. I was always just focused on trying to shield my kids from things and tell myself I was a strong person. It wasn't until about, about 10 years later that I really started to think about it. And my mom and my dad, um, my family finally started to share what happened that day, what they experienced, how it affected them. And that's when it really hit me that it was serious. And I was so fortunate to live and be alive. I just feel really lucky to be here. I always tried to question what happened to me. I still have not found any definite answers about what happened to me. Uh, I did ask Dr. Whitehair what they did with my uterus because in my culture, both of them, after we have our babies, there's different um, ceremonies and rituals that we go through after we give birth. And that is a huge part of both of our culture and we are both matriarchal. And that plays a lot into how women are supposed to be viewed. We are life givers and we are sacred. And I was not treated that way, but I finally was able to accept that I, I am a vessel for life.
and that I do count and my life counts and my children count. But in that journey of research, I have found so many stories of so many women who have passed away um, just from their doctors not listening to them. And um, a lot of them are minorities, sadly. But I wanted to share my story mainly because I am Native American and there's so many other things that play into this. I could talk for hours about everything that it affected and it still affects. Um, but hopefully I can try to share that in my, the questions that I was asked. But I just wanna thank you guys for listening to my story and hopefully it'll help you to think ahead for women who might possibly experience what I go through, but also value the life of all of those mothers who are bringing life into this world because they are sacred and they should be taken care of properly and i'm hoping that in sharing my story i can help with that i just want to thank ms husky for for sharing her story i see by a miracle um, she actually is able to has been able to join our um, video and so after our next speaker who is Dr. Jennifer Whitehair who is the obstetrician gynecologist who actually took care of Ms. Husky um, she's going to give us some reflections on uh, working in a tribal health center as that provides some unique challenges. Dr. Whitehair. Thank you, Dr. Stratton. And Sheree's story is still very powerful to this day and very touching. And I think I still have some PTSD from that day as well. I remember it well. And um, it, she hit on so many important points um, and struggles that um, our people experience uh, with their isolation, um, their distance to healthcare and uh, infrastructure issues. So um, I will be, um, I'm just go ahead and introduce myself again. I'm Dr. Jennifer Whitehair. I am an obstetrician gynecologist on the Navajo reservation. Uh, I'll be speaking today about maternal morbidity and mortality in the indigenous population. Uh, next slide, please. I have no disclosures. Uh, next slide. And um, as I said before, I have been practicing on the Navajo Reservation. I've been there for 16 years, and these are some of my lived experiences. Uh, on the Navajo Reservation and treating the Indigenous community. I just wanted to start it off with some background information before we dive into the topic. There are approximately 5.2 million people that identify as Indigenous in the United States and 573 federally recognized tribes. The Navajo Area Indian Health Service is one of 12 regional units of the IHS in the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services and it delivers care to approximately 245,000 Native Americans in five federal service units. The five federal service units are Chinle, Crown Point, Gallup, Kayenta, and Shiprock service units. And there are two tribally or 638 units uh, that are in Arizona as well. And these are Fort Defiance and Tuba City. And I work at Tuba City uh, Indian Health Service, or I'm sorry, Tuba City uh, Regional Healthcare. Uh, we became a 638 unit about 20 years ago. Um, prior to that, we were Indian Health Services. Um, the approximately 40% of Indigenous people live in non-metropolitan rural areas, both on and off reservations. As Sheree described, some of these areas are very remote. So care can come sometimes be 50 to 75 miles off of a dirt road, which makes it difficult for um, ambulances or emergency services to reach those areas. The incidence of severe maternal morbidity and mortality is greater among Indigenous women compared with white women, 2% versus 1.1% respectively. And within each group, the incidence is higher for rural versus urban communities. 
Indigenous women are approximately three times as likely as non-Hispanic white women to die of pregnancy associated causes. Next slide, please. Women of color carry a disproportionate burden of maternal mortality. And in Arizona alone, American Indian women and Alaska Native women have the highest pregnancy associated mortality ratio. 100% of these deaths were considered to be preventable, either due to postpartum hemorrhage or severe hypertension um, and stroke as a consequence. The severe maternal morbidity rate was the highest for American Indians and Alaska Natives at over three and a half times the rate for non-Hispanic white women. And severe maternal mortality rate was again the highest for women living in rural communities versus women living in urban communities. It's important for this data to be analyzed and mandates to be enforced to change this trajectory for the future of the indigenous population. Next slide, please. Native American women are at increased risk of adverse outcomes and death secondary to multiple comor comorbidities and other social injustices such as increased rates of type two diabetes, gestational diabetes and obesity. So one of the questions you might ask is what effect does living in a food desert have on these healthcare disparities? For those, that, those who have not heard of the term food desert before, it refers to an area that has limited access to affordable and nutritious food. In contrast, an area with greater access to supermarkets and vegetable shops uh, with fresh, fresh fruit and food may be called a food oasis. In Tuba City, we have one grocery store with fresh fruits and vegetables being the most expensive items. And the nearest competitive grocery store is approximately 75 miles away. When we look at increased rates of hypertension, gestational hypertension and preeclampsia in this population as they are increased, one has to wonder what does the effect of the lack of running water play in these disease processes? On the Navajo Nation, approximately 30% 30, 30 of people do not have access to running water, and Navajo Nation residents are 67 times more likely to live without running water than the general population. 67 times more likely. That is a number that seems unimaginable in a developed country. They are often forced to resort to unregulated water sources that are susceptible to bacteria, fecal matter, and uranium. And water in the Navajo Nation currently has an average of 90 micrograms per liter of uranium, with some areas reaching upwards of 700 micrograms per liter. In contrast, the Environmental Protection Agency considers 30 micrograms per liter the safe amount of uranium to have in water sources. This is significant secondary to the impacts, the health impacts of uranium consumption. They include kidney damage and failure, as kidneys are unable to filter uranium out of the bloodstream. There is an average rate of end-stage renal disease on the Navajo Nation of 0.63%, which is significantly higher than the national average of 0.19%. And even just living near a uranium mill mining area has been linked to birth defects among babies with mothers who live close to the mill. And then when we look at increased rates of domestic violence, 84.3% of Native women experience violence from both Native partners and non-Native partners. 56% uh, experience sexual violence. And violence can be committed primarily by non-Native men as it is difficult to prosecute. Um, and also factors that uh, play into that are um, the lack of law enforcement presence on the Navajo reservation and on other reservations as well, as well as jurisdiction issues. Substance abuse disorders are also increased and there is no access to inpatient rehabilitations on tribal lands. We can also look at systemic racism and institutional bias. These date far back and the lack of the trust of providers can promote poor physician patient relationships. Geographic isolation of tribal and IHS hospitals can also result in poor physician recruitment and lack of continuity as we know, a lack of continuity can result in missed or incorrect diagnoses and suboptimal patient care. Another issue is loss of access to care for urban indigenous women in the fourth trimester. This loss of care results in loss of primary medical care for hypertensive disorders, diabetes, and mental health care. A lot of times we don't see the issues of PTSD 
or birth trauma arising until later on in that first year um, and even beyond um, breastfeeding and even beyond that first year after the baby is born. Next slide, please. I would just like to highlight some of the outstanding care that I believe I am a part of on the Navajo Reservation and the model that we practice at our institution. So the model that we practice at our institution is a midwifery-based system and midway, midwives at tribal and IHS facilities provide prenatal care and deliveries to low-risk patients. Midwifery-led care is recognized as the best choice of maternity care for low-risk women and it's achieved with continuity of care good antenatal preparation and support throughout labor and birth by a dedicated team of midwives. Over the last years, the C-section, last 20 years, the C-section rate has been increasing worldwide, leading to severe maternal complications, including placenta accreta and placenta percreta. Our OB physicians at Tuba City provide high-risk services for postpartum hemorrhage, C-section, operative vaginal delivery, and consulting services during labor. Our docs and midwives work together to provide best practice care while also allowing for traditional beliefs, practices, and ceremonies to be carried out during the birthing process. Next slide, please. In our facility, we also have safety bundles in place to improve maternal care and prevent morbidity and mortality. These policies are in line with the California Maternal Quality Care Collaborative Bundles and we also participate in the Arizona Perinatal Trust Program. The trust reviews our OB policies to ensure that we are up to date with ACOG and JCO standards for evidence-based care. Next slide. However, there are several areas and gaps that can be researched, funded, and modified. To start off, impl implementation of safety bundles as a key research project. I would like to propose all emergency care, urgent care, and labor delivery units of tribal facilities to have mandated safety courses similar to ba basic life support. <clears throat> How many out adverse outcomes could we potentially prevent with these measures in place when that patient hits the emergency room or urgent care or labor and delivery and these uh, bundles are activated right away? Research that addresses learning barriers for Indigenous students and medical school entrants. Does implicit bias significantly decrease with an Indigenous provider or somebody that looks like the patients that we are taking care of? How does this improve the patient relationship? Food deserts. How does a food desert affect obesity, hypertension, and preeclampsia after supplementation with healthy and fresh foods during the antenatal period and the postpartum period? And behavior health, substance abuse, and domestic violence shelters. We know we have, we can offer little to no um, services in all of those areas. How much can we improve morbidity and mortality when these issues are addressed in the antenatal and the fourth trimester? And we are also difficult, um, have difficulties uh, taking care of patients all the way to the end of the fourth trimester, especially when mental health problems do arise, given that they sometimes do not come back right away for care or that we do not recognize um, these significant impacts of birth trauma on the patient. Next slide, please. In summary, decreasing morbidity and mortality in the Indigenous population is multifactorial, as discussed here today. And this final slide summarizes the key recommendations as a start to decreasing maternal morbidity and mortality in the Indigenous community. And I won't read through all of these because I covered most of them. But finally, President Biden just declared the month of November to be the National Native American Heritage Month. In this declaration, he addressed some of these issues. So I look forward to see how future policies will impact Native Americans and overall quality of life and longevity. Thank you for listening today. Thank you so much, Dr. Whitehair, for giving us this perspective. I'd like to encourage the members of the roundtable to turn on their cameras. Um, I realize Sherry Hus Husky may not have great bandwidth. So uh, I leave it up to you, Ms. Husky, about whether or not you want to turn on your camera. Um, I'd also like to uh, serve and the moderator's prerogative. I know that Mr. Johnson has done some very impactful work to support families around these situations and I, I'd like to give him 
uh, a moment or two to, or a couple minutes at least to, to describe that work because it's been very um, important. Thank you so much. Um, you know, I just want to just thank the um, the amazing panelists for sharing their their stories, and I know that um, we're living something that is so painful. Um, is is not easy and I just want to just recognize you and just uplift you. So I'll just kind of jump in real quick. So I've been really fortunate to work in collaboration with a lot of wonderful people to do some things that we're really proud of to take steps to make our country a better, safer place for mothers and babies. So um, when we talk, when we talk about, uh, you know, I kind of look at this in three buckets, kind of um, educate, um, advocate and legislate. So from an education standpoint, making sure that we're giving we're helping to distribute uh, tools to make sure that families are better informed um, and empowered going into the birthing process. And these tools will give them the information they need to help sure that they help ensure that they not only survive childbirth, but they thrive, right? So understanding things like post, pre and post birth warning signs, right? So that not only the birthing person, but their partners understand what to look for if we're seeing swelling. I think that if we're seeing headaches, if we're seeing dizziness, a lot of these things that, you know, I think that one of the things that was that was so wonderful was being able to actually be informed so that you can help your providers understand that that fine line of what may be kind of overlooked or what needs more attention. Um, and so when we talk about advocate, making sure that the voices and experiences of people and oftentimes marginalized um, people are at the center of policy reform, at the center of legislation. And I'm so grateful um, to the committee for making sure that we are centering in this conversation the voices and experiences of Native American families. It's so critically important. Um, because on top of how our country is already failing mothers, there, as was so eloquently described, there is a whole nother set of um, challenges facing Native American families on top of a system that is already failing. And so from a legislative standpoint, um, we've worked on both state and federal legislation on the state level. Um, we've had some really big wins in California. We've uh, we passed the California Momnibus that does a lot of cool things, including making sure that every single hospital in California is required to have implicit mandatory implicit bias training. If you catch babies, it's required in the state of California um, for all hospitals and birthing centers. Um, it's going to take really important steps to doing that. Um, in a couple of states, including my home state of Georgia, we were able to expand postpartum Medicaid, Medicare. Um, just two years ago, it was only six weeks postpartum. We were able to extend it to six months. And now we actually just um, a couple of months ago extended it to a full year postpartum. And that's a critical, critically important piece to making sure that there is care available for mothers. Because that's one of the things that's happening too is that mothers are experiencing complications not just one, two, three days after delivery up to a year when some of these things, there are months down the road when some of these signs um, of distress are beginning to exhibit themselves. And what's happening is oftentimes women who are on Medicare, Medicaid had fallen off. And so they don't even, they're not, there's no way for them to seek care for these challenges. And the word, mothers are falling through the cracks, um, to the cracks in that, in that manner. But the largest legislative piece that we have going on right now, and some of you all I'm sure are familiar with what's called the Momnibus. It is an unprecedented legislative package package comprised of 13 different pieces of legislation, right? 13 different bills, all addressing the various aspects of the maternal mortality crisis. Um, you can learn more by going to forecureformoms.com. Actually, let me actually not, I mean, I wanna encourage everybody, if somebody can put it in the chat, if you, there you go, look at y'all, y'all are quick. Did y'all see that? How quick that popped up in the chat? This group is amazing. Um, but yes, you can go to that, that link and learn more about all the various bills in there. And you can also go to forecureformoms.com and sign the petition. If you take 30 seconds, you can enter your first and last name and your zip code. We will automatically generate a letter that will go directly to both of your state's senators, as well as your local congressional representative, not only asking, but demanding that they support this legislation. It'll take 30 seconds of your time. Um, 
But this bill is going to do a lot of amazing things. And I want to just also talk about one of the things that's overlooked. Um, and that is the impact of the environment on mothers. And thank you so much for speaking specific with specificity about how that's affecting Native American women, but that's something that's also oftentimes overlooked. And so within that package of bills, we have a bill specifically um, affecting, um, addressing the the needs and how climate change and environmental factors are affecting mothers, um, pollutants. We have a bill that affects, that addresses social determinants to change. We have a bill that is going to provide funding for technological innovation. It's called the Tech to Save Moms Act, and it goes on and on and on and on and on. 13 different pieces of legislation, including the Kira Dixon Johnson Act, which is named after, um, you know, our angel Kira. And so we're proud of this legislation. There is a chance that this may actually get passed this year in a year in lame duck session. If not, we're going to be right back at it to ensure that it um, gets uh, passed in the first quarter of, uh, of, of uh, 2023. So um, those are just some of the cool things that we've done and we're just getting started. Thank you so much. I, I was hoping that that Ms. Husky was going to be able to chime in her thoughts, but it looks like she got bumped off. So um, thank you so much, Mr. Johnson. I'd, I'd like to ask each of the panelists, starting with Dr. Carter, if you could wake up tomorrow Having gained an ability to improve postpartum health care, what would you do? I think the answer to that question depends on where you live in the United States of America. So I did my training in, in Boston, and I, but I'd have a very different answer in Boston. But living in the state of Missouri, when patients come to me as a high-risk obstetrician, they are often already so sick. If you come to me at seven weeks and you had type 1 diabetes and your A1C is 14, I should have seen you months before. And so I would actually say um, many of the things that Mr. Johnson was just talking about, health insurance, it's it's not the end all be all. Um, it's not perfection, but I feel like that is a huge move in the right direction. And the fact that our patients in Missouri fall off of Missouri Medicaid 45 to 60 days after delivery um, is sinful. So if, if, I, if I had one in Missouri, that's what it would be. Okay, Dr. Bandatini. What's what's the one thing that you would do to gain improved postpartum care? One thing that's really tough. You know, I think we all recognize this is a complex conversation. Um, and and by the way, uh, Dr. Carter, congratulations on the Elevate program. Uh, that's one. It it's something that would at least be a starter to help. I feel like we just in general don't have enough support for the mother, whether uh, the mom has uh, um, a partner or family around or not, having a baby is stressful. It's really stressful, right? And you have no idea what you're doing, especially as a first time mom. And we have like stressors from work. You get guilted for taking too much time off, right? Um, when you, it's, it's not surprising women don't go back to see their doctor because you're told your OB says, don't bring your baby with you. Well, what if you don't have childcare? You know, and so there's so many things that are, I think, really challenging that I, I feel like there needs to be a better universal support system um, that supports in, in, a, in a very broad fashion. So I, you're giving me one wish, so I'm going to make a really big, broad wish. Better screening for mental health, better screening for people who are at bleeding risk, better screening for um, cardiovascular disease. And so if there's some way to comprehensively do that and not just drop the mom when they've had their baby, right? We, we need that, that sort of support, that sort of, uh, sort of um, I think, something to say that we haven't forgotten you. And yes, we do hear you. We see you. We recognize you. So. Thank you. And it looks like Ms. Husky has been able to join us again. Welcome. Um, I, I was wondering if you had something, if you woke up tomorrow and gained an ability to improve postpartum care, what would you do? What would you recommend? I'm trying to unmute. You did it. We unmuted you. We can hear you. Okay. Okay. All right. Yes. I'll, hi, everybody. I was able to have really bad reception right now, but um, I just wanted to share that Dr. White here, I love you. And I thought everything that she talked about was spot on. 
Um, and I feel like, you know, we're us native people, we really do um, cherish having a doctor like her there at our hospital because she can relate to us. And it's very helpful that we have somebody who understands our way of life, which is very uh, difficult where we're at. And I didn't even know a lot of the statistics, the statistics that she shared. Um, and it's just mind blowing that we are still going through this right now in this day and age. But um, everybody's stories really touched me. Charles, I'm so sorry for your loss. Um, I just wanted to thank you guys for doing this. And it's been really hard for me to accept all of the things that I went through. I'm still working through it. Um, my family is very supportive. They're actually sitting here with me right now. Some of them, my niece and um, her boyfriend, her mother-in-law, and they really enjoyed hearing everybody's stories. Um, and I just hope that this helped somebody, some other woman in some type of way. I'm always here if you guys wanna reach out or ask me any other questions. Like I said, it's, it would take hours for me to really dive into what happened to me, all of the things that played into it. Um, I did find in my own research that hemorrhaging is a higher percentage in women who um, experience domestic violence. Um, and I also have many other health complications because, because of that. I believe that it uh, stemmed from there. I went through it for Oh, geez, over 15 years. Um, I suffer from fibromyalgia. Um, I do have PTSD uh, from that, my experience um, with my hemorrhaging and with the domestic violence. And I suffered from pretty much a lot of those statistics that um, Dr. Whitehair uh, explained about. So, but I just want to thank you guys. Um, I'm always here if anybody wants to reach out and hear more about what happened to me or even help me to understand. If you ever hear in any other cases like mine, I still haven't found one that's uh, the same as mine. But I am very lucky to be alive and I'm lucky my kids still have me. And I'm very lucky to have my family who's been so supportive and um, I have great parents and I'm so thankful for the doctor, Dr. Whitehair and all the nurses and everybody who helped me that day. And I just wanna say thank you, uh, Pamela, Catherine, for you guys putting this all together. You guys did a lot of work and I hope that this helped you in some way. Thank <laughs> you. You guys have a good day. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Dr. Whitehair, I'm going to give you the la the last word here. If you okay. can wake up tomorrow, I I am not going back to, to Mr. Johnson because he explained all this great legislation that he's got going. So I'm going to I'm going to go to to Dr. Whitehair and give her the last word for if you could wake up tomorrow, having gained an ability to improve postpartum health care, what would you have done? Yeah, first, I would like to just thank Sherry and Mr. Johnson, and I think it was Dr. Bergatini for sharing their stories, because I think that's the most impactful and stories change, change people's minds. They change legislation, all the important work they're doing. Um, they're doing the most important work, I think. But if I could wake up tomorrow and change one thing about postpartum care, I would develop this dream model of a postpartum team and a postpartum team would exist of mental health. It would consist of um, family practice. Um, it would consist of uh, obstetric providers and midwives and even potentially doulas to really take care of the patient in a 360 to five, 365 degree fashion for that last year and support them through breastfeeding, uh, postpartum depression, postpartum anxiety, postpartum psychosis, all of these things that, um, that we don't catch all the time treat their hypertension, uh, treat their diabetes and make them healthier for their next pregnancy. And if there's one thing I could change just briefly for, for the patients that I take care of and my people, it would be access to clean running water and improved infrastructure and um, uh, telehealth services. So all of those things I think would make a big difference, but I guess it's a big dream, but potentially 
through this um, workshop and through all the people listening that have the ability to make change, we can make that happen. Thank you. So did I ask you, Dr. Carter, for your last word? I, I apologize if I didn't. I'm losing track of our Asking organization. Asking for my postpartum dream. Okay. I just wanted to make sure. We're, and then I, I need to turn it over to our panel chair for questions. Thank you Pam, so is, much. Yes, go Pam, ahead. And this is Kate, I will just step in and say if we're going to um, move the session to be ending at 1245. So if you have one more question you'd like to fit in to all of the uh, roundtable speakers, feel free. We have time. Thank you. Up to you. Okay. Um, the other question that I'd really like to ask is what does equitable health care look like for you and your patients? Um, would you like to start with that, Dr. Carter? Um, so it's a, it's a really hard question. I'm grappling with it. Um, because I dream of a world when everyone, regardless of your race or economic status um, or your station in life, um, has the promise of a healthy birth outcome. I think it's hard. There was a question in the chat that asked about um, race concordant care. And one of the things that I didn't say when we started this work is when you looked around the room, all of the clinicians were white, except me, and all of the patients were black. And it's like the elephant in the room, like you actually discuss that. And, and there's all kinds of other issues in terms of why that might be the case. And how do you practice care when that is the scenario? Um, and so I, I will say, as a group care provider, I, I, I feel like I come back to that constantly because I feel like it addresses many of these issues. The pipeline is broken. And so, you know, every Black woman or Indigenous woman is not going to have a person caring for them who necessarily looks like them. But how do we all have the capacity to take really good care of people? And I think that there's components of group care. I'm not saying that's the answer for everyone, um, but that help us to provide better care. I think part of the issue is that as clinicians, we often have different, you know, religion, race, economic status. And so like we see patients as, as somehow being different or other. Um, and at the end of the day, we all have the same hopes and dreams. And I think that group care helps us to break those things down have a shared similar experience. And so we're actually treating everyone really well and seeing the totality of the patient and not, not seeing the, the others and the differences. And so I guess the closest conception I've seen to equitable care really is in the groups that we have where we break down those social barriers and I think take much better care of people um, because we see everything at play in their lives and not just that 10 minute encounter. Thank you. So, Mr. Johnson, are, are you still available? Would you like to say, you know, either a, a reflection, thought, or opportunity, or what equitable health care looks like sure. for you? Um, if I could maybe take a stab at both questions with an answer to the question about uh, having a superpower and how I, what I would do if I woke up tomorrow um, and my big thing would be the ability to um, inject compassion every single place it was needed. And I think that the reality of the situation, we look at health equity in American healthcare across the board, there's a what I call the great American compassion deficit. And it is the inability of providers, systems, um, to see the patients that they are caring for, every single one of them, in the same way they would their mother, their sister, their daughter, right? Compassion is where we are failing. And a lot of these issues of bias are rooted in a lack of compassion and the inability to connect. Um, and I think that that is a huge first step because it doesn't matter if people have access to care if the care that they receive you know as dr carter mentioned is not equitable right it doesn't matter if we have the services and we have the infrastructure to support mothers in the way that we would like to do if these providers are not leading with love and compassion um because a lot of these stories that we hear and so from my perspective um 
I spend a lot of time dealing directly with other families that have been impacted by uh, mater maternal death, um, obstetric violence, um, you know, near misses. And the fundamental thing, regardless of class, regardless of race, regardless of geographical location, that we see time and time again is I expressed my concerns, I was dismissed, I was my care was delayed, and by the time they finally did something about it, it was too late or nearly too late. And if we're able to just simply give people the ability to um, humanize people on a, ma on, a, on, a, on a micro scale, but on a macro scale, we've got to stop. The reality of the situation is it's tough for people to hear, but we have to stop putting, not we, but the American healthcare system has to stop putting patients over, profits over patients. That's what it comes down to. Um, and compassion is a huge is a huge factor in that. Thank you. So, Ms. Husky, do you have a last thought or how to think about equitable health care right now? Or opportunity in the field? Um, not right now, but like I said earlier, um, if anybody wants to reach out or, you know, con Okay. Um, and Dr. Bandatini, do you have any? I think thoughts? Mr. Uh, Johnson was very uh, eloquent in, in how he stated things. I mean, equitable health care, it, it would mean, I, I think, you know, I'm, I'm still thinking on this and it, it's not, it, we want equitable health care, but I think we want equitable um, also outside of, let's say specifically health equitable supports and I, I love, you know, I was watching looking at the chat and seeing all these ideas about um, community support partnerships, um, helps uh, with uh, educating patients and about motherhood and, and what's normal and not normal. And so, you know, my idea of equitable health is, is having those support systems in place for everyone, having the support systems again with just jobs for everyone. Um, so that you don't have to, you can focus on yourself if you're not worrying about losing your job if you take too much time off. And, and so, you know, that that equitability, it's, it's, it's across everything. It's, you know, um, knowing, you know, I think I saw someone mention home visits, right? Uh, having access to those things without having to, I guess, beg for it or have someone specifically identify you as saying, oh, this person is in need. That should be available regardless, right? And, and I think that's my, my idea of equitability is that um, health and uh, mental health and social supports and community, uh, community supports, those should be available uh, universally. Thank you. Dr. Whitehair, I'm gonna give you the last word again. Thank you, Pam. So I think for my community, equitable healthcare would be that um, all providers and healthcare providers are held to um, the highest standards. And uh, just like some of our panel members said today, that um, you know sometimes there are some areas that are lacking, and whether it is in education or in um, um, in compassion, that um, that we are held to a higher standard because we have two lives in our hands. We have mom and we have baby and um, that's important for our patients and, and their families and their outcomes. Um, equitable healthcare looks like having just as good of equipment as um, tertiary care centers have. So my patients don't have access to interventional radiology and um, you know, some people are very lucky and have that option. And uh, so that would be equitable to me. Having the same outcomes um, for Native Americans and black women as um, as white women have. And so are, you know, lowering the morbidity and mortality in those um, in those populations. So for me, that would be equitable health care, taking a healthy baby home and enjoying your life with a healthy wife. Partner. Thank you. And now I will turn it over to our independent channel panel chair, Dr. Davidson for for further questions. 
Thank you, Doc, Dr. Stratton, and thank you all. I, I join in, in expressing how powerful uh, the conversation has become because you have been willing to share these very difficult stories with us. So thank you. We do have a number of questions from the audience in the chat. Um, I'm just gonna pause for a second and see if any of the independent panel members have any questions or comments that they want to address um, to the workshop uh, presenters. Dr. Jefferson, I have one. Okay, please. Um, thanks again for the, the presentations. They were, they were really meaningful. Um, it occurred to me, and um, the issue of hospital or birthing center length of stay after delivery uh, occurred to me from several of your stories. Now, now there's been, since I've, my career, um, I've seen it sort of shorten and shorten, and there are lots of various uh, good outcomes from that. Um, but I wonder if there's not an unintended consequence of a lack of time for sufficient monitoring and health education in terms of uh, side effects, after effects of delivery that could have maybe impacted some of the story. So I just wondered if you guys have any, had any comment about that. One thing I'll say in the chat, somebody mentioned home visitation programs. And, you know, I think that the standard is that most people who are vaginal delivery tend to stay for around two days for a C-section, it's three to four. Um, and I don't know that people need to stay in the hospital environment past that point. I think the issue is that you leave like all of this care in the hospital setting and you go home to like a desert of nothing. And, you know, like a lot of European countries have these nurse visitation programs. And I, I think that we could do so much more to support young families in their homes and in their communities. And so I think to answer your question, we need to do more, but I think we should do more in the community and in the home, not necessarily a longer hospital stay. I just have a comment too, to um, kind of, I agree with everything Dr. Carter said. But I think education is really key um, for those patients that we can't get home visits to. I think what I've heard in this um, in this panel is that you know people didn't want to be they didn't want to bother their providers and um, they weren't sure what to do. They weren't sure if this was abnormal. And I think maybe we're not doing enough with education um, postpartum. Uh, and I think if we improved that, we may see uh, better outcomes and uh, and have visuals. You know, a lot of patients learn by visuals, and there's so much information in that postpartum period. You're learning what what to do for the baby and how to take care of the baby. But I think maybe we're not concentrating enough on on mom and warning signs. Just pausing for a moment in case any of the other. Uh workshop members would like to comment or add their thoughts. I'll just throw in there. I'll admit, you know, I had a C-section. People say usually C-section people stay like three or, or four days even. I, I want it out. You know, I'm like, hospitals are dirty places. There's pseudomonas running around. There are other things. So I actually advocated to get home earlier. And I, I think I would agree with uh, Dr. Cardin what she said that I don't know that staying actually the time I had thought about that the time in which I was bleeding the most it was out of that usual window. So, you know, it, it probably would have been helpful for me to maybe ask more questions early on about how much bleeding should I have been expecting and, and maybe that that might have been helpful. But I don't, I don't think necessarily having a longer uh, initial length of stay would have helped. I have um, a couple of questions and comments from our audience uh, from um, a practicing OBGYN clinician. Um, there's some questions that I think uh, you've raised for this person uh, when there's objectively medically what seems to be a good outcome. Um, how could questions be posed um, and when would be the best time to ask to see if for the patient the experience um, of the birth and the uh, postpartum period um, is in fact causing problems. I think this person is asking, you're, you guys are giving voice to some of the problems that have happened and um, the clinician would love to have your thoughts about different ways that this, this could be approached.
can you repeat that question one more time? Because I'm not sure that. Um, sure, that. they're asking um, if if the medical outcome is okay. What questions do you ask to get at the patient experience, and when is the best time to ask the patient um, if, in fact, their subjective experience is not a good one? Right. I mean, I think this, um, you know, ties into the problem with the amount of patients that we were that we're seeing. And so when we see a patient for post-op C-section and uh, postpartum care, that's typically at two weeks and six weeks. And if it's in a vaginal delivery, it's at six weeks only. And so, you know, maybe we are not um, asking the right questions um, at our postpartum visits, and maybe we are missing some of the main, um, main problems. We don't typically ask about birth experience. Um, we ask about bleeding and, um, voiding and breastfeeding and how's the baby doing and how is your mental health status? But I think maybe we might be missing some of those, um, those, those key issues. There's a, a question in the chat. Are there any, um, healthcare system level interventions that are effective in promoting respectful, compassionate care? Um, I know that's not necessarily something that this particular workshop was set up to address, but if I may take uh, chair's prerogative for a moment, I'm a foreigner. I was raised in a different healthcare system and I had my babies in a different healthcare system. Um, and I've often reflected on the differences that I've come to understand as I've watched um, some of the very isolating, fragmented medical care that I see here in the US. Um, I had my babies in Canada, and in Canada, there is a um, one hour, uh, I wouldn't use the word mandatory, but expected and welcomed um, uh, nurse visit. And the nurse asks all the questions you were talking about, Dr. Whitehair, in your home, with your baby, asking to look in your fridge, see what food you have there, um, uh, ask you how you're sleeping, how you're coping, who's helping you, and then pulls in um, the social support, the government services needed for every single child in the country. And when I started to think, when I first moved to the US, how could you take that kind of system and have it work here? I quickly came to understand, um, as we've been talking about social determinants of health and those upstream factors, that Canadians trust their government. They trust socialized health. They believe that someone looking at their fridge or asking them how much money they have or asking them if they're depressed will not lead to punishment, to a child being taken away, um, to stigmatization. And if we can't address those issues, uh, for the moms and the babies who um, are in difficult situations. Um, it's very hard to think of single health system level interventions that are going to address this adequately. And I just wanted to lift up the work of Dr. Karen Scott, Dr. Joya Crew Perry, because there are people who are doing this work in yes. terms of respectful care and working with health systems to do it. And I don't think any of us have a magical bullet yet, but I, I think there yeah. are some thought leaders who are very much in this space. And I will say one of the things that we're doing in our little small corner of the world is um, every single Elevate site, um, we do training for the entire site. So everybody gets trauma-informed care. And people were often interested in hearing our patient partner stories, and they weren't interested in that. It's like, we come share our trauma with you for what? Like, it, it's not actionable. What do you do with that? And so our trauma-informed care trainings are now done by our patients turned partners who come into the spaces where they are patients now empowered, teaching the people who are caring for them about trauma-informed care. And I, I think it's really powerful, you know, when a person is cussing, fussing, throwing stuff, and you're like, you want to be like, what's wrong with you in the clinical setting? just reframe your thinking to what happened to you because they didn't wake up that morning deciding to do that. Like yeah. something precipitated and it happened. And so we now do that training for like front desk staff, phlebotomists, like everybody in our clinical I, states are now getting those trainings. So I think <laughs> we're at the beginning stages of thinking through how to make some of these systematic changes. Yes, absolutely. And, th and thank you for calling out both those impactful interventions and the ways that we can maybe change healthcare systems. 
I've got another question um, uh, for Ms. Husky. Did anyone counsel you on the possibility of post-traumatic stress disorder after your event? It sounds like you dis you discovered or discerned that for yourself. And one of our audience members is wondering if anyone helped you in that journey. Just going across, maybe she's lost connectivity again. She's there. I don't yeah. know whether or not it. Yeah, I'm trying to unmute her and it's not working. So okay. she would have to unmute herself. So, so Dr. Whitehair, since you were involved, was there any formal way to, to manage that? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, as physicians, um, when we have something uh, so traumatic like this happen, we constantly go in, we have the same provider see that patient every single day. Um, we um, educate them as much as possible on what happened and, um, and, you know, and what could happen in the future. I don't know how much of that is absorbed in that in those moments. So how much of that is really helpful during that acute hospital stay? Because it's just like if you educate a, a post-surgical patient the first and second days and you think, yeah. I told them all these things, but they don't remember any of it, you know? So, right. I mean, I think it really takes a while for, um, for those feelings to even understand that they're going to, that they're going to come up. And, um, you know, could we do, do a better job in that first year? We definitely could. Do we have the support for that? I don't think that we necessarily do have the support for that. So, um, you know, maternal, um, uh, maternal health psychiatrists, maternal health um, <laughs> psychologists, I think, um, you know, those would be, those would be so utilized tired. significantly. Sherry? Uh, Sherry Husky, Sherry. can you yes, hear us? Yes, I can. Did, did uh, you my have... service is a little, a little sketchy right now. Right. Did you feel like you did you make the diagnosis of post traumatic stress disorder for yourself, or did someone tell you? And if so, when did they tell you? Oh, um, I had my I had a therapist who told me. Thank you. I had Sorry, a therapist yeah. who diagnosed me. Sorry, my my service isn't good right now. We understand, Sherry. Thank you so much. There was just a question from the audience, and I think that links very nicely um, uh, to what we were uh, talking about before you could join us. And I think as a follow up, because we are talking about not just the acute period uh, postpartum, but those longer times when feelings develop and and vulnerabilities or other issues start to arise. One final question from our audience is, um, are there any programs that uh, any of the workshop members have heard about or are thought were great exemplars um, that partner moms with moms to be? Um, that is that a peer support component uh, may help with the processing and the identification of problems uh, as some of you have so eloquently pointed out. I can um, start to answer that, Karina, because before um, COVID, we did have a uh, patient-centered pregnancy, which was group prenatal care. Um, but COVID hit the uh, Native population so hard and so significantly that I don't foresee that coming back anytime soon. Um, but I think in the future, it would be, um, you know, it would be a, another great support system. Right. And this one isn't medically based, um, but parents as teachers, um, you know, partners with families through the pregnancy all the way up until that child is like five years old, essentially going into kindergarten. So not necessarily medically focused, but peer support that's wonderful. Um, and we also have a program called Nurses for Newborns that actually has community health workers that are associated. These are kind of kind of programs that that we use heavily in St. Louis, but I feel like get at the spirit of, of that question. Yes, it does. Yeah, great. Okay, we are at 1245 Eastern Standard Time. Um, and so um, I'd again like to thank the, the workshop presenters for an incredibly impactful um, uh, leadership 
in helping us um, understand and get our arms around uh, the, the ways that this impacts so many people. Um, we're going to take a 30 minute lunch. And so we will be back now at, um, is it, I guess, 1.15. 1.15, yep. Yep, Eastern time. So just a reminder, um, if you're, if you can just mute, uh, but stay connected, then you can just come back in and we will continue uh, this afternoon. Thank you, everyone.
So welcome back everyone. We will get started um, with our afternoon session. Thanks for joining us again. Um, just a gentle reminder, you've heard this many times already, but if you have questions uh, for our speakers, please put them into the uh, chat pod by sending them to everyone. Um, and if you have any technical issues, please put them in the chat pod by sending them to all panelists. So we'll begin our afternoon session with the continuation of key question one. Uh, and actually, we'll be finishing key question one today, uh, I think. Yes, we will be finishing it today, we'll do, and then we'll start key question two. As a reminder, key question one is that a birthing person's entry into prenatal care, what combinations of risk indicators have the greatest effect on poor postpartum health outcomes? And we will kick it off with Dr. Uh, Jamie slaughter uh giving us a presentation on the social and structural determinants of maternal morbidity, mortality, and evidence map. Um, Jamie, I will turn it over to you. Thank you for having me today. Um, next slide. All right, just a quick disclaimer um, that the presentation um, is based on a report of research that's conducted um, by the Minnesota Evidence-Based Practice Center and findings and conclusions in this document are those of the authors who are responsible for the content. Um, and statements in the presentation should not be construed as official position of AHRQ or the US Department of Health and Human Services. Um, nor do we have any financial conflicts of interest. Next slide. So I want to acknowledge my co-investigators as well as the transdisciplinary nature of our team. Next slide. And as many of you know, um, maternal mor morbidity and mortality rates in the U.S. are increasing, as too are, is the attention to addressing contributing social determinants of health. The Institute sponsoring today's workshop asked the University of Minnesota to conduct a review of the literature on social and structural determinants of health and maternal morbidity. And today I'm going to be presenting part of that evidence mapping of the root of the literature we identified to help us understand how research has approached uh, the topic to date. Next slide. Social determinants of health represent the conditions or circumstances in which people are born, grow, live, work, and age. Next slide. Social determinants lie downstream from structural determinants of health, the structural forces that shape how social determinants are experienced by people in their neighborhoods and communities and the ways that resources and quality are distributed across individuals and communities. And together, these social structural determinants of health work to shape and promote maternal health for people across the different levels of influence. Next slide. So before I provide an overview, um, <clears throat> so before I provide an overview of our methodology for creating the evidence maps, I want to briefly just touch on some terminology. First, both terms, um, first terms labeling racialized people and marginalized groups, as well as medical diagnosis terminology has shifted over the years. In both of these cases, we use the same language with which the study author presented their results. Next slide. We also want to acknowledge that not all people who give birth identify as women and have attempted to use gender neutral language. However, when citing a specific study outcome, we use the study specific language. And we also want to highlight um, the fact that when discussing the risk, fa risk factor, um, such as racial discrimination, we use the word reported rather than perceived, regardless of the study author's choice. And this was because we wanted to acknowledge the fact that perception in this case is actually an act of recognizing the presence of discrimination and a necessary step in um, the appra stress appraisal process. Next slide. Next slide. So for our key question one, focused on pregnant people, um, it was from a pregnant person's potential entry into prenatal care, 
what combinations of risk factors have the greatest prediction of poor postpartum health outcomes? And to what extent did these patterns of predictors of poor postpartum health outcomes vary by person by person's race, ethnicity? Next slide. For key, uh, for key question two, which focuses on birthing people, we asked um, immediately before or immediately after delivery and before release from birthing related hospitalization or clinical care, what combination of risk factors of the birthing person have the greatest prediction of poor postpartum health outcomes? And to what extent did these patterns of predictors of poor postpartum health outcomes vary by race, ethnicity? Next slide. Our search um, strategy for the literature, the relevant literature to the key questions used a PCOT framework, and we looked for studies with social um, and structural determinants of health exposures. Next slide. Across the PCOT elements, um, the major um, distinctions between um, the two key, key questions um, focus on population. Again, key question one focuses on pregnant people um, and their potential entry into prenatal care, while que key question two focuses on birthing people just prior to, during, and immediately following delivery, but um, before the, their release from the birth setting. Next slide. Um, our search strategy for the lit for um, the uh, relevant literature to the key questions um, included using databases such as Medline, CINAHL, um, and um, Social Science Citation Index. Um, we used controlled vocabulary terms in our searches, um, along with free text words, and um, we restricted um our um literature set to those that were um published in english next slide so decision roles um studies that included a social determinant of health um only as a control variable were excluded um studies had to measure pregnancy at or beyond 20 weeks of gestation to be included and um, included studies focused on interpersonal factors as opposed to intrapersonal. Next slide. In terms of risk of bias, we subjectively prioritize studies according to study design and rigor of analytic approach to address selection bias based on Robbins E. We determined that all included studies were high risk of bias from a causal standpoint. And um, therefore, we continued with the review from the perspective of supporting future research researchers in um, generating hypotheses for risk factors as the basis for potential interventions. Next slide. We categorized studies into major social determinants of health exposures based on what was available in the identified literature. So today's uh, presentation is going to focus on structural and institutional factors, environmental factors, rural and urban factors, healthcare use, hospital factors, and socioeconomic factors. Next slide. We used alluvial graphs, um, also called braided rivers, um, to represent the, liter the identified literature set. Um, these graphs demonstrate the numerous and interwoven variables represented in the literature set. Next slide. Just to orient you to our um, braided rivers, um, each line represents a study that was in the literature set. The outer columns are the domains in which we at the University of Minnesota categorized or grouped exposures and outcomes. So the outer left column represents the social uh, determinant of health domains that we um, 
we created and the outer right column represent, represents the outcome domains that we created based on the identified studies. The inside columns of exposure and outcomes are how each study specifically talked about their measures and it utilizes the study author's language. Next slide. Next slide. We identified more than 8,000 records in our search of, the, of databases. And upon screening critical and critical appraisal, we included 109 studies for narrative synthesis. Next slide. This slide shows the categories of data sources that were used in the 109 studies that we synthesized. Next slide. This table presents the number of identified studies per each key question um, and by outcome domain and um, any special populations um, studies um, may have focused on. Outcome domains represented in the study in the, in the literature set included cost um, or healthcare use, cardiometabolic disorders, depression, diabetes, Hypertension disorders, next slide. Maternal mortality, substance use or, or mental health other than depression, maternal mor um, severe maternal morbidity and weathering, um, also um, known as cumulative allostatic load. Next slide. Um, in terms of our overall uh, key points, um, the included study exposures broadly covered social structural determinants of health. They still, and even though they broadly covered um, the social structural determinants of health, they still represent only, represented only a subset of potential um, social structural determinants of interest and did not address intersections with bio, biomedical um, risk factors. There's a limited depth and quality of available research within each social structural determinant, including racism and other forms of dis discrimination. We found an unexpectedly large volume of research on violence and trauma relative to potential social determinants of health, relative to other potential social determinants of health, and among outcome domains, depression and other mental health outcomes were um, a large portion of the health outcomes captured. Next. All right. So, um, focusing on our, our domain of structural and institutional factors um, for um, K our key question one, which focuses on pregnant people, we found a total of 14 studies that in uh, included a measure um, of structural and or um, institutional um, related to, uh, sorry, structural and institutional factors. Next slide. Just a reminder on our alluvial graph, one line rep, um, represents a study um, outcome. So within the social determinant domain of structural institutional factors, the largest outcome domains represented were depression and maternal mort um, yeah, depression, maternal mortality and and hypertensive disorders. Next slide. Only one study investigating patterns of intersecting social and structural determinants of health um, was identified. Um, as an exemplar, uh, uh, as an example um, of um, new approaches to um, looking at risk, ra risk factor research. Next slide. For, KQ, for the key question two, which focuses on birthing people, we found a total of 11 studies um, in the domain um, of structural and institutional factors. Next slide. And within this domain, the largest outcome domain represented was um, by far severe maternal mor morbidity. Next slide. Okay. 
So here we're looking at environmental factors um, as our social determinant of health domain. Um, and um, in for uh, key question one, we're focusing on pregnant people. We found a total of six studies um, that were relevant to this domain. Next slide. In terms of rural urban factors for key question one, we only found three studies. Next slide. And within um, these two, two domains, um, so environmental factors and rural urban factors, hypertensive disorders were by far the most commonly studied outcome. Next slide. For key, uh, key question two, we also found um, three studies focusing on rural and urban factors. Next slide. And most of these, most studies outcome um, uh, was severe maternal morbidity. Next slide. Um, moving on to the domain of healthcare use, um, we found two studies that pertain to key question one. Next slide. And only one study um, that pertained to key question two. Next slide. Um, in terms of um, the domain of hospital factors, identified studies were only relevant for key question two. Um, and we found a total of seven studies. Next slide. And um, severe maternal morbidity um, by far was the most evaluated outcome among these studies looking at hospital factors um, or health or um, uh, health care um, use. Next slide. Okay. So for the domain of socioeconomic factors, we found a total of 17 studies that pertained to key question one. Um, which focused on pregnant people. Next slide. And depression, hy um, hypertensive disorders, and um, cost or healthcare use were the most common outcomes um, evaluated in the study. Next slide. For key question two, um, focusing on birthing people, we found 13 studies. Next slide. And uh, severe maternal morbidity and um, cost of our um, health care use uh, were the most common outcomes examined. Next slide. Next slide. So, uh, um, just to sort of um, provide an overview of uh, wrap up the findings. Um, sort of the moral of the story is that messiness is necessary. The more the braided braided the river um, in our alluvial graphs, the more information we have to understand the interrelatedness of the factors. Um, we're trying to we want to capture complexity rather than reduce it. And um, we have to remember that um, the topic of today's workshop is, or the, these uh, the workshop over the next couple of days is highly complex. Um, and our groupings are subjective in the presentation based on what we found in the literature. Um, you know, other investigators reviewing um, the same set of literature may have um, grouped um, the domains differently. Next slide. Few limitations um, included studies were required to have examined the impact of a social determinant of health. Therefore, we excluded many studies um, that focused solely on comorbidities. Um, and um, because of our wide scope, we focused on quantitative epidemiologic studies or similar research. The included studies um, 
did not fit cleanly into discrete groupings, um, which really made us um, or required us to um, categorize exposures um, subjectively. Next slide. Um, there's several places where future research is needed. For example, there's a need for additional research focused on the impact of social determinants on maternal health to inform prevention and intervention. And this work really must move beyond research and disciplinary silos. Um, there is a need for research that expands the domains of social determinants of health examined, but also the mechanisms and pathways by which the social determinants of health impact preg pregnant persons and birthing individuals care and outcomes. And this review really only represents the cusp of social determinants of health and maternal health research to come. Next slide. Organized and curated catalogs of maternal health, health exposures and their presumed mechanisms really could facilitate future examination of um, exposures. Um, and researchers, um, we need researchers to name the form of racism that they are examining, the mechanisms by which that form of racism may work, and other intersecting factors that. Um, it may that may compound its effect and then um, researchers can improve adherence to basic reporting standards, um, which would make it easy to identify high quality research and how it contributes to the field. Next slide. Next slide. So, um, the, um, uh, Link our sorry, our review. Um, you can review the full report uh, that is available now um, for public com comment through December fourth um, through the available link, and um, a link um, will be provided to you in the chat. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Slaughteracy, for that um, for that information regarding the evidence review. Uh, and also to, for reminding people to um, review the full report and provide their comment. Um, okay, we will now hear from our next speaker in this, in this what I just remembered is a long session. So we will have three um, speakers uh, coming up back to back and then we will take a break uh, just to let people know what's coming. And first we will hear from Dr. Melissa Simon on implementation science and its role in achieving perinatal health equity. Thank you, Dr. Simon. Thank you so much. It's so good to be here. Thank you all for inviting me. Um, next slide. Oh, I think you were going to. Oh, I am them. doing it. I'm just yep. trying. Oh, there we go. Okay. I, um, I am a part of the NIH Office of Research on Women's Health Advisory Committee, of which I am a current member. And this presentation does not necessarily reflect my, um, represent the views of them. Uh, it is my individual views. Um, so architecture and design matter. And I'm here, I'm tasked with trying to uh, caps, encapsulate all of implementation science and why it's so important to advancing maternal health equity and all of these spaces we're talking about in this P2P um, workshop uh in 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 15 minutes so please uh, excuse my rapidity in in getting through all these slides but architecture and design matter it all of the organelles in an animal cell are really critical to um, a, you know, thriving in the environments in which they are in, not, so, not just so that they can do their own specific job, but so that they can do the job together as an orchestra to actually make a beautiful symphony and make that cell function and thrive um, in all instances. And what that requires is in order to understand how that cell can work best and create that symphony, you have to really understand what each of those structures are, 
how they're designed and how they function and then their real relationship to the others. So there's structures embedded in structures and structures that influence other structures and processes as well. And so looking under the hood of the car is critical in implementation science and in what we do. Um, so if you think about it now, I'm using a tree for equity um, and, and health justice, and that is an organic structure, but make no mistake, um, structural racism, structural inequities, all of these processes and structures that are bent um, are not organic. They're human made on humans, human imposed on other humans. Inequality means the structure is fundamentally bent and not in favoring some people over others and actively disadvantaging others in that upper left-hand corner. And in the right-hand corner, upper right-hand corner, people say, well, we're all equitable, we're all equal. Um, no, that's not true. Um, if, we, if everyone was equal, then if we provided everybody the same process, the same type of prenatal care and postpartum care, then everybody would achieve the apple, right? Everybody would get um, great outcomes consistently, but that's not the case because the underlying processes and structures and processes that influence other processes are bent. Um, and so in the lower left-hand corner in the equity framework, we um, assume that there's bent um, structures. And so what we do is give everybody a different type of lift to get to that apple and that outcome. But what we really need to do in terms of that intersection of health equity, implementation science, centering patients, centering community and lived experiences is health justice in the lower right hand corner, whereby we ask the crucial questions is where are those trees bent and how do we unbend the trees? Because that's critical to getting to our outcomes that we're trying to uh, address in this workshop here over the next over these three days. And we know that oppression and uh, systems of oppression, including racism and structural racism impact health. Dr. David Williams figure from the the 2019 Health Services Research shows that. And we know that through things like allostatic load, um, the weathering hypothesis and others, that those things in the basement of that picture are really impacted by um, generational and personal experiences of racism and discrimination, psychological responses being impacted, biological processes, behavioral responses, healthcare use responses, and individual and collective responses. So environments matter, right? And we know that we've had a long history of oppression and slavery and racism in this country. We know that we are emerging from a pandemic of COVID-19, but also syndemics of disinformation and distrust, which are critical in implementation and design and processes of, um, uh, uh, of interventions and supports and care that are required to actually improve maternal mortality outcomes and, and, and maternal health in general. Um, and we know, as we've just heard from the social determinants of health, how all those things uh, in the environment actually influence why, in this picture, the yellow, orange people and, and the drawing are further away from the edge and have all of these supports in the case they follow for the, over the edge of the cliff. And whereas the green people in this picture are situated near the edge without all of those supports because they have been systematically excluded and oppressed. The other thing is, is when we're talking about research in general, and this is an NIH conference, so I have to uh, acknowledge that there are structures even embedded in our research review, our research design, our um, publication process, uh, how we um, uh, get diverse participants into our trials, and how we disseminate research findings, and how we really center the roles of community patient advocates, lived experiences, persons uh, like many of the ones that shared their stories this morning are so critical. So we, we have to acknowledge that even the trees that are designed uh, uh, within the NIH and within our research structure are bent. And we have to seek to deal with uh, unbending those trees as well. Uh, clinical trial diversity um, and 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 study design and all of that is really critical to what we do. The other thing is, is when we're talking about perinatal care, postpartum care, all of those things, we have to understand that it access has a lot of facets. 
there are dimensions of access that uh, involve in the upper left hand corner, not just risk factor management, quality and consistency of care, but actually as a former member of the United States Preventive Services Task Force, receipt of guideline concordant care and how that plays out across clinic to clinic across many geographical areas across our country is not the same and it's not consistent and needs to be better. In the lower left hand corner, training of the workforce, which I'll talk about in a couple more minutes, diverse workforce, bias mental models, um, lack of, of cultural humility and responsiveness is really critical to the care that we provide. In that middle circle, financial toxicity, financial well-being, um, reimbursement, payer policies, all of those things influence how, for example, how a healthcare system will partner with community organizations and wraparound services to um, address social needs and social determinants of health. How, how is that reimbursement policy gonna play out as we move in the future, as social determinants of health are, are being more, are, are captured more in our medical records? Um, for example, and then not just having insurance is enough as what we talked about earlier this morning on the pa panel. Um, it's about all those out of pocket costs that are um, involved with taking a day off from work to go to the clinic and and the amount of visits that you have to do for postpartum and prenatal care. And then, you know, how those visits occur, do the people come to you or um, all of those things create out of pocket costs to take care of children and other loved ones, et cetera. And in the lower um, right hand corner, biased mental models, experience of maltreatment and discrimination, that's not just personal, that goes for your friends, your sisters, your family members, generations of being, um, feeling distrusted, um, if, I'm sorry, generations of maltreatment in a healthcare system, and in the upper right hand corner, the, the social um, and determinants of health. Um, so can, this is one of a lot of different uh, implementation science frameworks. It's the Consolidated Framework for Implementation Research. And again, what I'm trying to show you is that all of these environments are really critical to understanding implementation of something um, because there's so many processes at play and there's processes embedded in processes and processes that influence other processes. And so when you're thinking about implementation science, it's all of those processes together and how they interact and influence each other that impact outcomes and equity. And so when we talk about implementation versus implementation science, it's really critical to understand what I'm saying here with respect to the actual science. We're, it's like engineering, looking at that design and those, and those iterative processes and interactions. Um, for example, this is not meant to be read. What it's meant to be is just an example of what the National Academy of Medicine did recently over um, a couple of years of uh, through a series of webinars on what would it take to actually um, get rid of obesity in our country, to address the epi epidemic of obesity in our country. And what we came up with over a series of several webinars um, is really this systems map that shows all the different processes and stakeholders and players and um, people who are, and groups that are important that are involved in the obesity epidemic and what it would take um, to actually get address that ep epidemic and how they all interplay with each other. So understanding that um, is a really critical point when you're trying to think about where your particular program intervention idea fits within this uh, within this greater picture of trying to address um, the questions that we're addressing in this workshop today. And so we know that maternal mortality disparities are widening. We know that over 80% of maternal deaths are avoidable. So what are some of the things we can do from an implementation science perspective to try to address this, given all of those mechanisms and processes that work together? So there's a couple. So. On my team, we do a lot of different things that address different parts uh, of these processes that are involved in trying to move the needle on improving uh, maternal health uh, equity and, and reproductive justice. Um, one is um, an NIMHD R01 study uh, called Optimize. And what we're doing is looking at perinatal care, routine perinatal care that most pregnant and birthing persons receive in this country. Um, and what we're trying to do is um, look at the cadence of visits, um, where the visits are located, 
Are they televisits? Are they in-person visits? Um, and then trying to embed trust questions and trust visit up front as opposed to the first prenatal visit that happens where we where we uh, dump a lot of information on a particular uh, pregnant uh, person uh, and expect them to just digest it all. Like really taking the time and, and really just taking a step back and spending a visit just talking about what goals and expectations are for this pregnancy. What are the fears? Um, what could we actually do to help you? And that is more person-centered. And then what we do in the postpartum time as well is important. Um, another uh, project that really thinks about implementation is embedding checklists. We know that checklists like in aviation are critical to why our airplanes in general are very safe to fly on in this country. And, and those checklists, why aren't we doing more with respect to checklists um, in our own country with respect to perinatal care? So um, we know that the top five priority areas, given our maternal mortality um, uh, numbers and, and which deaths are really avoidable, um, we have this checklist that we're working with um, doulas and other um, uh, support people, community health worker models uh, around mental health, cardiovascular symptoms, safety, opioid and substance abuse and social support. And can we create a checklist um, that is implementable um, by a wide variety of people to help touch, be a touch point for um, a pregnant and birthing person along these main five things in either the perinatal, in any part of the perinatal period, pre or postpartum. Um, one example of um, implementation though is really about then bridging what we've learned to policy and i just want to give a shout out for an exemplar of what a very encompassing um policy set of policies the momnibus that didn't make it through congress um didn't make it through the senate but um uh, there will be a 2.0 and uh, it's really important just to see this as an example of what can be proposed in our at our federal level to actually impact social, economic, political factors that influence health, especially in the realm of maternal health. The other thing is that we do on our team is a lot of different workforce development uh, opportunities. So creating more opportunities in those and pathways, uh, as opposed to I don't like using the word pipeline, but opportunities and pathways to really improve our diverse workforce and um, across multiple levels of learners. So from high school students all the way up to faculty, um, including an NIH first grant most recently funded and a T37 NIMHD uh, training grant in addition to critical programs to feed the pipeline and physician scientists like the were the NICHD were her program and um, so in we really need to be strategic and intentional and make the good trouble and and really look under the hood of the car and really try to ask the questions why see how things are structured and how they interact with each other because processes interact and influence each other and those are critical to implementation science which then will uh, advance maternal health if we really look at all those structures so in conclusion some of the gaps uh, that I see that we uh, really need to highlight are um, in implementation science uh, knowledge across the full spectrum of perinatal care, including postpartum care, with not just implementation, but de-implementation. There's a lot of practices out there that are that should stop being done, right? Um, and it, that is probably one of the hardest things to do is to learn how to um, unlearn something and to do it in a different way. Um, and then sustainability and sustainment is really critical. Um, there also is uh, the case for the study of implementation of state and federal policies that impact pregnant and birthing persons. So we don't really know much about what has happened so far in the states that are actually in, trying to implement one year postpartum Medicaid coverage. Um, we're, we're not sure about what's going on with respect to state mandated anti-racism and anti-bias training for healthcare providers. Um, the impact of overturning Roe versus Wade on state and federal level policies is going to be critical to continue to, to research because abortion care is part of the perinatal care and postpartum care that that is necessary for um, all pregnant and birthing persons in this country. Um, impending policies regarding affirmative action and diversity in our scientific and, and 
healthcare re, uh, workforce is critical because that that's going to come into play very soon. Um, and then moving forward out of the COVID pandemic, uh, how this will impact the scientific workforce with respect to a focus on women's health research, because I will have to say a lot of um, people of color and women uh, have been uh, more disproportionately impacted by the COVID pandemic, having stepped out of the scientific workforce or taking time off. How do you get them back on? How do you get us back on the train and going forward? So availability of bridge funding and other things to help keep that pipeline going because we need people of color and and women to actually do this research um it, it's really critical um we still do not know how best to address social economic environmental religious affiliated healthcare systems and political factors that impact appropriate perinatal care how do health centers community hospitals and larger health systems really address these factors and what kind of research is needed to best come up with these options what are reimbursement models look like moving forward, like I mentioned earlier. And postpartum healthcare requires transdisciplinary teams and referrals, especially for things like mental health support, cardiovascular disease, and diabetes. We still do not have a good, do not do a good job of appearing as a, a true team for postpartum individuals that require such teams. And checklists may be one way to do this, especially from an implementation mindset and a systems um, thinking, kind of design thinking uh, mindset. Um, and then along with better integration of patients themselves, their loved ones and their doulas or community health worker or a patient navigator, how do we get them better into the team as opposed to having like the obstetrician on one side, the midwife on another, the doula here, and a, a, a loved one here, like really trying to get people more more onto the team. And then finally, my final slide is there's a huge need for better knowledge translation into establishing guidelines for clinicians and decision making policy makers. And, and I, I do applaud the, the um, current uh, funding opportunity uh, for the maternal health research centers of excellence. I applaud them for having a, a finally a separate implementation science hub call for proposals and how that will uh, link with the data hub and how that links with the multiple centers. But could there be a policy center as well, a policy translation center. Oftentimes, you know, NIH is really tasked with trying to impact clinical care, uh, right? Improve the health of the nation. And to do that, we have to influence policy. And so why is that policy thing usually just a sidebar for dissemination strategy as like a few sentences in your grant, as opposed to being an actual core or an actual hub that links with each of the centers? Um, and designing for dissemination is critical. Communication expertise is needed and should be embedded as a standard in grants for all NIH. Disinformation is rampant. And when we receive federal taxpayers' dollars to do research, there should be accountability to communicate communicate it effectively. And there's there is an opportunity to be creative with JAMA, New England, Journal of Medicine, Lancet, and others to have brief, brief research communications and multiple media outlets to summarize key NIH-funded research without having to actually um, get through that whole publication pi pipeline to, to publish a full manuscript. Um, so again, um, it's really important that we center community and not just have community steering committees and advisory boards. Um, but why aren't there community uh, steering committees and advisory boards embedded in each of NIH's ICs um, at NIH? Um, again, food for thought and things that could actually improve health equity across all disciplines, but especially maternal health. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Simon, for this great um, presentation on implementation science. Thank you. Um, so we now welcome Dr. Ebony Marcel, and she will be presenting on midwifery um, in a birth center model utilizing reproductive justice framework. Thank you, Dr. Marcel. Do not forget to put on your camera. You not see me? Hello. We do. We, we see Sorry, we do now. now. Yep. We're oh, fine. Okay. Cool. Hey, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I just want to acknowledge the fact that so many amazing presenters have been speaking the last couple of days, and um, I'm just really, really inspired um, by what I've been hearing. 
Um, so today I'm going to talk to you about midwifery, of course, and then also what midwifery can look like in a federally qualified health center that includes a birth center and what it means for midwifery to utilize the reproductive justice framework. Next slide. I think you're going to be advancing. Do you remember? I am. Don't worry. I'm Yay. on it. So <laughs> I have nothing to disclose. And I just wanted to kind of, you know, I'm, I'm talking about this now and feeling like you all already know this, but just the challenges we've had having these bigger, broader discussions about improving our maternity care system has really, really challenged with having the conversation about the effects of racism. Um, we had some beautiful, brilliant um, speakers that have really, really dug into that. And I'm gonna talk more about what this looks like with midwifery. Same with reproductive justice, Dr. Bridges did an excellent job, but I think it's really, really important to talk about and the examples I'm trying to give today about how, you know, we have to balance out the, the power, right? Power is a huge part of racism. Um, we have to talk about addressing intersectionality. Um, we have to make sure that, you know, just like the previous speaker was talking about, you know, centering the most marginalized, um, what that really means and what that really looks like, um, you know, and how it can often, you know, there could be appearances, but still really, really not utilizing the community's voice or even asking the community what they actually want. Um, and then we need to really, really join together um, because this isn't, a, this isn't anything that one person is going to fix. Uh, I am having a struggle with the fact that, like, you know, definitely I want to appreciate doulas and respect them, but, like, doulas are not the only solution and I'm, I'm, the only thing that's going to fix this larger and broader problem. So just to kind of give you a little bit of examples that I feel like, um, you know, we're seeing in maternity care. Um, is, you know, just to give you an example of racism with patients and providers. So patients are the left side. So complete avoidance with systems, distrust, um, poor experiences, microaggressions, harmful, harmful interactions. Um, and then the care options, a lot of times, are not really greatly resourced. Um, so they, there may be some access, but like the clinic that's there is, you know, pretty terrible and doesn't have a lot of, you know, a lot of, you know, not only resources, but availability. Um, but we need to also talk about how we're still challenged in that realm as well. Um, care options are often limited and talking about midwifery, midwifery primarily in this country, you know, we, we have, I like to tell people have been here since the beginning of time, but currently we, a lot of folks are not able to access midwifery, and that's usually linked to not only legislation, financial reasons, um, but really, really happy that the midwifery model is able to be prevalent in um, especially under resource settings. So with providers, believing myths, still we have providers that believe certain biological myths. Um, unchecked bias, stereotyping, um, I really do feel like it's hard for some of the community to accept the fact that they are can be harmful and that maybe they are definitely perpetuating white supremacy culture and racism. Um, lack of cultural awareness, um, minimal opportunity for cultural congruency, um, and you know, the blame narrative, right? So a lot of you know, our, our medical system is about like, well, what did the person do wrong? Um, and it's their fault. So just to talk a little bit more broadly, well, well, a little bit more honed in, sorry, about DC, currently we have no hospital east of the river. And that's important because DC makes this, you know, kind of like lovely diamond. And at the bottom half of the diamond where most of the, the families that are having the most challenges, there's no OB services available for them and they have to travel. Um, and I don't know if any, whoever lives in DC, you know, it's it's not usually, not always quick to get across this very small, you know, town. Um, minimal high risk obstetrical services. Um, and then still like families reporting really, really terrible experiences at the hospitals that maybe they traveled, you know, two hours to get to. Um, food deserts, high rates of housing instability, 
police brutality concerns, you know, and foundationally unresolved address, unaddressed trauma, and then COVID just adding a whole nother layer of challenges. So at Community of Hope, we are, um, we have three locations. One location is in North, in Northwest, one in Northeast, and one in Southeast. And the two locations that primarily the midwives are at, um, we have a patient population that's pretty much like 95% Black. 90% um, of our patients are 200% under the uh, federal poverty level. Um, and then predominantly we're serving wards five, seven, and eight with the worst birth disparities. Um, so what have I been working on building? Um, the, our midwifery team is um, intentionally 80% Black. We are the only freestanding birth center in DC. Um, and at this point, we're probably one of three FQHCs that have a birth center left in the country. Um, a decade more in the past, like there were, I think at, at, at most up to like 13. And like, why is that? Why aren't there more models like this? We have 10 midwives, uh, four family practice docs, two family nurse practitioners who also provide prenatal care. Um, we have a unique program, right? We have centering pregnancy. We have individualized direct patient support with our care coordinators. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit more about them. And then um, the midwifery model of care with hospital or birth center options for, for birthing. And just to kind of pin that right there. So we have almost 400 birth centers in this country. Um, out of that 400, maybe a strong 15 are Black-led or Black-owned. Um, the other element to that is a lot of birth centers are not able to accept Medicaid, um, primarily for the reimbursement and you know, the overall sustainability and infrastructure of maintaining that birth center. Um, why is that? So, you know, unique is here we are, we're a birth center, we're also a birth center that accepts Medicaid. So another um, big important gem. Um, we also are going to be, pilot we, we currently are piloting a year long postpartum program and I'll talk a little bit more about that at the end. Um, talking more about like our care coordination and what that kind of looks like. We have perinatal care coordinators. We have group care coordinators. We have um, reproductive health coordinators. We like to, sorry, they're now sexual health care coordinators. Um, and all these different people really allow us to kind of like bear hug people in this process. Instead of, you know, maybe one person who's trying to do all six positions and then really spread super thin and burnt out, but like having all these different individuals focused and able to really, really spend the time and, and assist families is huge. Um, midwives do prenatal care, postpartum care, family planning, GYN, and newborn care. A lot of people don't realize that uh, midwives are trained to care for newborns up to 28 days. And what that looks like is supreme continuity. So like we're able to care for our birthing individuals while they're pregnant. Um, we provide that early postpartum care and also that early newborn care. Um, and having that continuity is huge. And then we're able to roll um, right on over to our family practice provider. My goal today is also to like completely convince everyone that this is what we should be doing. We should be having a model where we can do that. Um, and then we also have Healthy Start Doulas, but you know, it's another grant funded program. It's limited um, while it's awesome and a great opportunity, you know, it's just never gonna be enough. So our perinatal care coordinators, just to dig in a little bit more about what they're doing is they're conducting risk assessments. Um, they are checking in with patients every time they come, checking in with patients when they're not there, calling them when they've missed appointments, helping them get rescheduled, um, making sure that they're getting, you know, making sure they're getting access to our Healthy Start doulas if they're eligible, getting them into centering pregnancy. Um, we commonly hear some folks, folks say, oh, I'm, you know, worried about the transportation piece, um, able to set up rides. Um, so just having this, this concentrated individual that is there to try to assist the birthing person through the whole pregnancy is immeasurable. 
it's really, really like, I feel like we need one for before pregnancy, during pregnancy, and also after pregnancy, somebody that just has complete and focused care. So what does RJ framework look like in maternity care? So, you know, in a nutshell, it's about acknowledging, you know, our system and that it's broken and that it needs to be fixed. And, you know, just like, you know, we heard today, there are a lot of things that we continue to do that we probably should not be doing, um, but having a hard time letting them go. Um, it means having awareness, like looking like, okay, let me look at these systems. Let me look at, you know, how we're asking families to interact and care with us. Are they punitive? You know, are they judgmental? Are they potentially causing harm? And a great example about that is, you know, creating a space where you're telling people they can't bring their other children. What if they have nobody else to keep the other children? What if the person at home, you know, they're suffering from some undisclosed, you know, intimate partner violence. So not being able to bring their children becomes this barrier. And a lot of times people just don't go, right? Um, it means being su supremely patient and family centered, asking people what they want. Um, we also have a hard time, you know, understanding that we may have in our minds what maybe the answer is for this individual that still kind of aligns with the blame narrative, but we need to get to a place where we're like, what do, what do you want? What do you think would be helpful? Um, making sure that we're normalizing shared decision making. I know that's like a common thing. Um, it annoys me because I see it in a lot of like notes nowadays, and I just feel like people are not really doing it, but really, really supporting and um, shared decision making. Another great example, I had an individual the past week who was really confident that um, there was a lab error and asked to, uh, you know, really, really did not want to receive treatment until it was confirmed and wanted to be retested. And I have seen this situation play out across the years in different times and spaces where maybe I didn't have the power or the voice to, to make that decision, but I was able to support her and say, okay, sure, let's retest and let's see. She was right. She was absolutely right. There was a lot bearer. So like really, really supporting people and listening to them and respecting the fact that they are the, the experts of their body, their situation, their circumstances. Growing and supporting cultural congruency. So we are black providers make up some of the lowest percentages in the majority of disciplines. Um, and there are multiple reasons for what that is. And, you know, thinking about midwifery, I basically refuse to not have students. It's somewhat a level of dismay sometimes from my my um, my team, but I make it mandatory to always have a student and I prioritize having black students because I want to make sure that patients are experiencing that cultural congruency. Um, and I've worked other places, I've been other places, I have other colleagues across the country who work in institutions that say, oh, we can't take students. That's problematic. Like, how are we gonna grow and build this diverse workforce if nobody's taking students? So making sure that like we are prioritizing taking students. We also still need to do a lot of work in these education systems. Um, you know, not only the, the level of like, medical medicine harm, but also the just, there are a lot of people being harmed in education programs, black, um, black individuals trying to gain the education, the space, you know, to ascend and really, really having a hard time in some of um, these programs. And then like, you know, really, really looking at what could be possibly causing barriers. A great example is that I have, you know, we have a lot of patients who are late and a lot of people feel like, oh, if they're late, then, you know, too bad, reschedule. We don't turn away late patients, late prenatal patients and late babies. We, I don't care if you're 15 minutes late or four hours late, we still see you. And, you know, what I've learned in time is that be, doing that and, and, and creating that space, people are so appreciative. I can almost argue that the majority of the time, if they were late, they make sure that they're not late the next time. 
because they're so appreciative that you still saw them. So, you know, again, that's us looking at like, hey, why aren't people getting seen? Wait, they're getting turned away because they're like 10, 15 minutes late? No, you know, really, really taking a look at those things. Um, some key recommendations, like I can't express how important care coordination is. We need it, like folks need it. They need all the things. <laughs> um, and we need more innovative programming. Like, you know, we, I still find that people want to apply what has been done in the past and like, it's not working. So we need some new ideas. We need to also make sure these ideas are aligned and that we're hearing from the communities that we're caring for. Um, but it's, it's not, it's not pushed in the way that I feel like it should be pushed for and also paid for, right? Funding, that's a whole nother discussion. Um, strong collaboration with your community. Um, one of the like most amazing things that I really, really have appreciated about my leadership at Community of Hope was we had to move locations and it was very important from, you know, CEO, leadership, VP of Health Services that we asked the community what part of DC would they be okay for us to move? Like, are they okay for us to move a little further out or do they want us to stay close? And like over, like, of course, majority of people said, no, we want you to stay close to this current location. And like, for me, I was like, wow, like we're gonna do what they asked us to do, you know? And that really doesn't always get to happen. So it did end up being, you know, an odd number of years trying to find space in DC, but it was prioritized by my CEO, by my leadership, and that's huge. Um, and like, I always, you know, we've talked about the implicit bias trainings. I just, I'm sorry, like two hours is not gonna make anybody less racist. And it's like that individual is not gonna fix the entire system that is broken. And so, it needs to also be something that is continuous and ongoing constantly. Um, and it's woven into your organization and all the things that you do. And, you know, because unfortunately, being able to check a box is going to keep us exactly where we're at and still having the, the same challenges that we're having. Um, of course, I know everybody heard Joy Career Perry. Monica McLemore, Karen Scott. I also want to shout out to Dr. Jamila Taylor, who is now the head of WIC. You know, Reed Medical Bondage, you know, Dr. Cooper Owens. Um, I, I think my original, original um, slide was, you know, uh, shouting out Dr. Rachel Hardiman, fangirl her a little bit, um, Dana Ayn Davis, and then like some organizations, right, that are Black led. Um, and that are unapologetically focused on, you know, Black birthing families, National Association to Advance Black Birth, the National Birth Equity Collaborative, Black Mamas Matter, Black Women Birthing Justin Shades of Blue, Root in Ohio, I could go on and on, but like prioritize listening to these organizations that are out here and doing the work and can tell you, you know, what needs to happen. Thank you so much, Dr. Marcel, for this presentation. Do you have one more slide left? I've lost no, track. I just. No. Are you sure? I think I had some extra points that I just wanted to squeeze in and I think I got them in. <laughs> okay, wonderful. Thank you so much. I just want to make sure we have um, time for Dr. Suffern before we get Absolutely. to the break. Um, so Dr. Suffern, take it away. And then I think we will end. Um, Start to break about five minutes late, but I'll chat you when we, when that time comes. Okay, thanks. Okay. Um, hello, everyone. Um, I'm really honored to be here and part of this conversation over the next few days and especially today. Um, I want to start out by acknowledging that although I'm going to be talking about healthcare for incarcerated pregnant people, I myself have never been incarcerated, but I collaborate um, with previously incarcerated women um, who help guide and inform um, the research uh, that my team does and are, are part of our research team as well. I also wanna amplify the terminology statement um, that Dr. slaughter acs presentation reviewed and uh, we'll be employing those same concepts and, and uh, guidance and terminology. And I also wanna add, since I'm talking about incarcerated people, um, just to note that I, uh, that I advocate using person-centered language when talking about people who are incarcerated. That means avoiding words like inmate, offender, even prisoner, 
and just referring to them as um, as a person who happens to be in, experiencing incarceration at that time. Um, next slide, please. Um, this is my disclosure, and I am not going to. Uh, what I say today is uh, by no means necessarily the views of the National Commission on Correctional Healthcare or the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists. Next slide, please. So why should we care about incarcerated people? Um, we heard a very brief mention of incarceration as a structural determinant of health yesterday in Dr. Bridges' talk, but what about people who are currently incarcerated? Well, if we are to understand the structural and historical factors and social determinants of health that shape especially racialized differences in maternal morbidity and mortality, and if we're to understand how our society has differentially valued some, devalued some people's reproduction and rep and promoting others, then we have to look at what, hap what is happening behind bars in the United States. Because what happens in prisons, jails, and detention centers, so shielded from oversight and public view, it tells us a lot about these particular individuals who are, um, who are getting care or in some cases not getting care behind bars. But it also tells us how our society treats marginalized people and their reproductive well-being when no one's paying attention. So how many people are we talking about here? Well, when it comes to women, we've seen over the last four decades a steady increase in the number of women behind bars uh, for the last 40 years. And uh, the most recent statistics from the Bureau of Justice Statistics estimate that there are um, about 153,000 females um, in prisons and jails in the U.S. on any given day. Um, and although the U.S. only has 5% of the world's female population, we have 35% of the world's uh, female prison population. Next slide, please. The majority of women who are incarcerated are of reproductive age, and most of them are mothers and primary caregivers to young children. So think about that ripple effect when a, a female, whether they're pregnant or not at the time of their incarceration, what happens to their families and communities when that person becomes incarcerated? There's a substantial ripple effect um, on, their, on the children, families, and communities. Now, most women who are incarcerated in the US are incarcerated for minor charges that have less to do with them being threats to public safety or having individual pathology, than, and much more to do with root causes of inequities, things like poverty, racism, unstable housing, unequal access to quality education and employment opportunities, untreated mental illness and trauma, among, among many other things. Next slide, please. And when we think about uh, the people who experience incarceration, especially those who are pregnant or postpartum at the time of their incarceration, we have to think of, of them at the intersection of numerous systems, um, numerous systems that marginalized and, and oppress their reproductive well-being, um, ones that historically and contemporarily do as well. Um, healthcare systems, carceral systems, child welfare or family regulation systems, and the reasons that they're, that people are incarcerated incarcerated, especially women, have so much more to do with broader structures, policies, and histories, again, than they do with someone being a threat to society. Now, from a racialized perspective, it's, it's impossible to ignore those dimensions of our the U.S. carceral system. You can look at the statistics. Black women are incarcerated at twice the rate of white women. Um, American Indian and Alaska Native women, as the BJS reports, the Bureau of Justice Statistics reports their demographics, they're incarcerated at over four times the rate of white women. And these are due to overlaps between numerous systems, especially ones that police and criminalize certain behaviors in pregnancy. So pregnant people in the U.S. have a very distinct relationship and involvement in the criminal legal system. And this is something that legal scholar Michelle Goodwin um, has explored, as well as um, legal scholar Dorothy Roberts has also written about these uh, and researched these extensive connections. Um, and this research has shown that everything about incarceration in the U.S. disrupts the core tenets of reproductive justice that Dr. Bridges and that Ebony Marcel just reviewed. Next slide. So what are some of the health conditions that um, come to bear on pregnancy, postpartum, and other reproductive health issues for this population? Well, we know that incarcerated women have high rates of uh, lifetime histories of physical and sexual trauma, um, as high as 82% in some studies, very high rates of co-occurring mental health conditions, 
um, very high rates of substance use issues, high rates of transmitted infections, and high rates of chronic disease. And I want to underscore, well, really all of these, but especially chronic disease, because when people do talk about health care and incarcerated people, um, which isn't very often um, or often enough, there is some attention to the mental health uh, trauma and substance use needs, but chronic disease rates are very high in this population. Next slide. And we, if we are thinking about the preconception, pre-pregnancy, pregnancy, and postpartum continuum as, as somewhat as determining someone's overall life course and their, their health and well-being, then we have to recognize all of the, the overlap of all of these conditions, which are in much higher prevalence among incarcerated women than non-incarcerated women, and among incarcerated women compared to incarcerated men. And these disproportionately high rates of these various conditions, those are not, again, not related to ind individual pathologies. Those reflect upstream structural inequities that manifest themselves in dispar health disparities. Now, incarceration itself exacerbates all of these conditions, in part because of the variability in quality and quantity of health care that is available. And in addition, what happens or does not happen in custody when it comes to people's pregnancy, postpartum, and other health care? This has long-term and intergenerational impacts. Next slide, please. So what does prenatal care and postpartum care look like for incarcerated people? Well, the only straight answer I can give you is it depends because there's this very unusual um, circumstance where incarcerated individuals are the only people in our country with a constitutional right to health care. That's based on a 1976 Supreme Court case um, that determined not to do so was cruel and unusual punishment. So institutions of incar incarceration are constitutionally mandated to provide access to health care. But exactly what that health care looks like is highly variable because there are no mandatory sets of health care standards or services and no mandatory systems of oversight or accountability um, to oversee prison and jail and other institutions of incarceration. So you get a lot of variability. There are some prisons and jails that provide a reasonable measure of access to quality prenatal and other pregnancy and postpartum care, and others that have don't even have a policy as to what their prenatal care would look like. It's variable whether care is available offsite or onsite, um, who provides it, or whether it's not even available at all. The frequency of prenatal visits, the frequency of postpartum visits, what the, what each visit might look like. Um, one study found that um, half of state prison systems, nearly half, had no pre-existing arrangement for where they would take a pregnant person if they went into labor while they were in custody. Um, an issue which I won't discuss in great detail, but is, is one that has, um, has had significant research um, and a lot of policy implications is the issue of shackling pregnant people um, throughout pregnancy and also during birth, which has um, many medical and ethical um, uh, uh, challenges and violations and harms. Um, and there are now 40 states that prohibit the practice, but laws are not enough. We know in implementation of these laws that they are not followed, and that is due to factors um, not only at the level of the, um, the incarceration institution, but also at hospital level levels. Next slide, please. So what about data regarding pregnancy outcomes and postpartum outcomes for people who are incarcerated? Who collects data about these people? Well, the short answer is nobody. Um, so our standard um, databases and, and surveillance systems that collect maternal uh, health data, they do not include incarceration status. Um, so we don't know, maternal health outcomes, we don't know what's happening with incarcerated people. Um, the Bureau of Justice Statistics is a branch of the Department of Justice, and they're legislatively mandated to do certain data collections. Very few of those um, requirements and reports that they do ha have to do with health at all. And um, there, until very recently, there was no data that they collected that uh, related to pregnancy. So BJS did, did collect data about um, deaths in custody, but nothing about births in custody. That recently changed with the First Step Act um, of 2018. Next slide, please. So again, this is uh, currently nobody's responsibility. And without knowing the scope of the issues, how can we know what interventions need to happen? Next slide, please. 
So our research team at Johns Hopkins did undertake a prospective epidemiologic surveillance study for one year um, to collect data from 22 state prison systems, all federal prisons and six jails, including the five largest jails in the country. Next slide. And we found, I think the most striking finding is just documenting there are pregnant people who are incarcerated in the United States and their pregnancy, many of them, their pregnancies end behind bars. So we estimated, although we didn't have all US prisons and jails, we extrapolated that there would be approximately 58,000 admissions of pregnant people to jails and prisons a year. In our study, in our, at our study site, there were over 800 pregnancies that ended in all the prisons and over 200 that ended in our study jails. And you can see that they ended in a variety of ways, but the majority of these pregnancies ended in live births. Um, there were no maternal deaths during uh, our study collection. This was during this was from 2016 to 2017. Um, and we did also collect data on infant placement. Most infants were placed with a family member, but the second most common placement um, after an incarcerated person gave birth was in foster care. Now, importantly, one of the limitations of our study is that we couldn't collect individual level data from facilities. They all reported um, aggregated uh, de-identified data. So we, we don't have any information about race, ethnicity, and other factors that might tell us more of a detailed story about what's happening with incarcerated pregnant people. Next slide. So our study and subsequent studies have also um, researched what is uh, the prevalence of opioid use disorder among pregnant people and what is available in terms of treatment. Um, the standard of care being, of course, um, access to methadone and buprenorphine and avoiding withdrawal. We know that incarceration is a huge risk factor for fatal and non-fatal overdose. This is true in the um, non-pregnant uh, non-pregnant population. And that, that risk of overdose is really substantial, especially in the first two weeks when someone gets released from incarceration, the nearly 100 times increased risk of fatal overdose. Um, and we know that providing access to treatment in jail reduces uh, risk of overdose. Um, so in our study of, a of prevalence of pregnancy and outcomes, we found um, that we estimated that there would be about 8,000 admissions of pregnant people with opioid use disorder to prisons and jails annually. 8,000, that is a substantial number of people who are interfacing with these systems and who need access to treatment. However, unfortunately, and not surprisingly, we found that access to methadone and buprenorphine in pregnancy in prisons and jails is, um, is not universal um, and is highly variable. And we found that um, uh, although many jails and prisons might continue methadone and buprenorphine if someone was on it pre-incarceration, very few actually give pregnant people the opportunity to initiate medications while in custody, therefore forcing them into withdrawal and putting them at risk for overdose when they get released back into society. Now, I think a really striking finding with this also is that even at the places that provided, that continued or provided access to methadone and buprenorphine, the vast majority of them discontinued those medications once the pregnancy was over. Next slide, please. So what other postpartum care and outcomes do we know other than what I just mentioned about the um, preponderance of discontinuation of methadone and buprenorphine in the postpartum period? Well, we know very little. If we know little about pregnancy and incarceration, we know even less about postpartum care. So in our surveillance study, um, we estimated that there would be about 55 postpartum people present each month, but that does not include screening people for postpartum status at entry because most jails and prisons don't ask a person, have you given birth within the last 12 months? Uh, another study by Rebecca Schlafer and colleagues at the University of Minnesota um, found that the prevalence of postpartum depression among incarcerated women was at, who gave birth in custody was as high as 34% which is no surprise given the high baseline rates of mental illness in this population, as well as the trauma of being pregnant and giving birth while in custody. Um, in terms of lactation support, it is possible and feasible for incarcerated postpartum people to provide breast milk to their infants. It requires a lot of care coordination, a lot of effort, um, and there are many, um, many issues uh, surrounding it, and it's, it's, it can be a challenge, but it is possible. And our study found that 11, 11 of the 22 prisons that we studied did allow it. However, um, there aren't a lot of supports in place, even if a policy might allow it. And in our study, there was an average of only eight breastfeeding individuals per month, and that's compared to 55 postpartum people per month. Um, 
contra access to postpartum contraception is also fairly limited. Um, at the prisons in our study, less than half allowed initiation of a postpartum contraceptive method. Next slide, please. I would be remiss in not highlighting some of the qualitative research that our team has, has done and qualitative research that others have done. Um, we've studied pregnant incarcerated people um, uh, around their decision making with regarding pregnancy and care. We've studied them, uh, pregnant incarcerated people with opioid use disorder. And across these multiple studies, um, the themes are consistent that there is profound uncertainty and fear among these people about what's happening to them, what kind of care they're in the middle of receiving. They, they get very little information. They don't get test results. They're concerned about their personal safety and the safety of their fetus. They don't know what's going to happen if they go into labor and give birth in custody and have fears about who's going to be able to be there. Um, doula support has been shown to improve outcomes and experiences for incarcerated people. But as we just heard, although that it's absolutely essential, we promote doula care, especially for this population. That is not the answer um, to improving the singular answer to improving outcomes. People experience profound disconnectedness from their social supports. And then, of course, if they give birth in custody from their infants, because most of them are separated from their newborns immediately after birth. A lot of women in our studies described uh, feeling judgment and experiencing stigma from custody staff and from carceral health care providers, but also from hospital perinatal providers. So hospital based providers who have nothing to do with the carceral system also treat them in negative and discriminatory ways. And you can see some of the quotes here. Um, I'll just highlight the underlined area. One woman um, describing her stress and distress around the uncertainty wondered if she gives birth in custody. Are they even going to let you hold your baby? Another woman described um, feeling uh, judged and stigmatized as well. Next slide, please. So in summary, what are the knowledge gaps um, and what do we know about this population? Well, we don't know very much. Um, we have some limited data, but there are no ongoing data collection efforts. We don't have any data disaggregated by race or ethnicity. Um, we know that incarceration causes harm to people's physical and mental health. And that likely contributes to postpartum maternal morbidity, um, but we don't know, especially after incarceration when people are released. Um, we know very little about what happens in terms of postpartum care and screening, um, what staff do and what staff know about postpartum care. Um, and we need uh, greater consideration of how racism that's embedded in incarceration relates to racism and disparities in adverse postpartum outcomes. Next slide. Recommendations include primarily recognizing that carceral institutions are part of the community. So if we are to understand um, and try to improve maternal health and, and, and reduce maternal morbidity broadly in the US, we absolutely need to consider institutions of incarceration. They are not over there. Um, they are part of our community and they are part of the cascade of care. Um, we need to develop systems for routine pregnancy data collection. And we need to include previously and, and when possible currently incarcerated people in various convenings um, and research methodologies. We need to standardize ways to measure, um, measure these outcomes. How can we use existing databases to signal incarceration status? We need to implement um, high quality patient-centered trauma-informed care and with the uh, principles of implementation science that Dr. Simon reviewed. Um, and we also need to evaluate policy um, policy changes, such as uh, policies like Minnesota, what they have done um, to divert pregnant people away from incarceration into community-based alternatives. We need to understand whether that's working, whether it comes with appropriate community supports, and whether other states um, and communities can invest in alternatives. Thank you very much. Next slide has my citations uh, for people. And uh, thank you all very much for considering this unique population. I was just about to say that, Dr. Pfeffer, thank you for bringing the incarcerated population into this discussion today. We really appreciate it. Um, okay, let's see. It's 2.38. We, we will take a break now and come back at 2.45, and then we will have a few more, two more um, speakers in this session before we have a discussion. Thank you. See you at 2.45. Okay, welcome back everyone. That was quick. 
<laughs> Hopefully we'll have time for a long break uh, in a little bit. Um, I want to welcome now Dr. Uh, Karen Joint Maddox. And she'll be presenting on using bundled payment models to achieve equity in pregnancy and postpartum outcomes. And um, Dr. Maddox, since it is 2.45, why don't you go until 3 o'clock if you can? And also don't forget your video. Can you hear me okay? Yes, thank you. Okay, now let's see if I can remember how to advance the slides. Okay. So this is my uh, disclosure statement. I have uh, research support related to uh, bundle payments more broadly, um, and everything I say is my own opinion alone. So I'm uh, really honored to be part of this, uh, this entire event. I've been so inspired by the, the folks that I've heard talk um, and by really the, um, the empathy as well as the science. Um, and I'm going to talk about something a little bit different uh, that um, I think will bring in some of the policy side of what folks have been talking about. So I'm going to talk about bundled payments. So to start with some level setting, um, what are bundled payment models? So bundled payment models um, take us from a scenario in which we provide individual payment for each service rendered into one in which we provide a single payment or a target price for services that are delivered. So that in and of itself uh, isn't so exciting. Uh, but what it perhaps allows us to do, and particularly in the setting of, um, of care for, uh, for pregnant persons, is to think about how we might tie in things like quality or bonuses or penalties or measurement to a clinical episode. So bundled payment models give us the opportunity to incent improvements in quality and reductions in spending by tying a financial mechanism to a series of expectations around a care episode. Now to have a bundle payment model, you have to be able to define to whom it would apply. So um, for example, pregnancy. You need to know who that bundle might exclude. You don't want particularly high-risk women. I'm a cardiologist. Having a woman with a, a pregnant person with congenital heart disease um, going through pregnancy, you would not want to include in a typical bundle, right? Because that person's going to need a very different set of, of resources. You need a duration. You need to understand what's included in the bundle. So are we including outpatient visits, delivery, infant care, for example? You need to determine how the payment is administered, so who's going to receive it and then uh, distribute it, how the performance is judged, what are some key quality measures, how cost targets are set, and what happens if those targets are or are not met. But the, I think the bigger question, if, if you sort of accept the argument that payment models may be a tool, um, is to think about how these could actually improve outcomes and equity, which is ultimately what we care about in this space. So the first is to reduce fragmentation and encourage coordination, basically saying we're all on, in the same boat here in terms of centering around a patient as opposed to centering around each of the services that the clinicians and, and various sort of engaged individuals uh, may provide. It also importantly could allow flexibility for clinicians to provide the right care at the right time from the right member of the care team. So be that through midwifery or doula care or community health workers or social workers, mental health clinicians, pharmacists, food or transportation support, whatever someone needs, particularly those things for which there's not a current payment mechanism. If providers, if clinicians are incented to be able to produce the best outcomes possible and given the freedom to be able to bring in the resources needed and the services needed and the connections needed, a bundled payment can free up some of those dollars um, to be able to fairly and appropriately reimburse some members of the care team who have, uh, sometimes it is difficult to get fair and appropriate reimbursement to. Bundles can also require data collection and, intent and, and require some intentionality around equity in, within that um, data collection and also in outcome measures as I'll touch on in a moment. Of course, it's always important to think about the risks or drawbacks of, of anything, really, but uh, it, payment models. So the biggest one is skimping on care. If you give someone a lump sum payment and they decide that they can get the same outcomes for their patients without delivering um, care, then you risk obviously not getting patients the care that they need. The goal is that you have measurement in place to offset that so that the incentive really is to improve outcomes, but there's always a concern about skimping on care. Some of the other ones, like waiting until after the bundle to provide specific high-cost treatments. 
So for example, long acting reversible contraception, which is a super important part of, um, of care, obviously, um, is potentially high cost for the clinician to you know, acquire, purchase, place. Um, and so you might wanna unbundle that specifically to avoid you know, creating a specific disincentive to getting people a high cost item. You also worry about risk aversion in terms of the patient population. So quote unquote, cherry picking becomes more profitable. Um, if you're getting a lump sum payment for each patient, you can quote unquote win by finding the least complicated patient. So there's ways to get around that, which I'll talk about, but it's an important thing to, to acknowledge up front. And I think super important is the potential disengagement of local providers, particularly those who are rural and community based. Um, again, you can think of ways around this, but if you set up a program without being very intentional about how important it is to uh, to broaden participation in and pre and postnatal care, um, and don't think about how you can engage uh, community based organizations and other key parts of the um, of the sort of support structure, then you will uh, potentially cause more harm. So are bundle pay payments being done anywhere? So they they are. M many states have a basic bundle, although many do not have a bundle payment model, meaning they may pay out of a bundle but not use that as sort of a vehicle to um, deliver quality measures, equity measures, um, or incent uh, different types of care delivery or partnerships. Many states have a shared savings model that's basically a bundle, and you can see a list here of, of a number of the places that have tried something like this. So Texas, New Jersey, um, Tennessee, Arkansas, Ohio, New York State, Medicaid, and so a number of places have done something when it comes to trying to bundle payment um, around uh, uh, pre and to some degree postnatal care um, along with delivery. The unfortunate part is that we really don't know if these programs improved outcomes or costs. So Tennessee, for example, reported increases in group B strep screening, screening and a 9% decrease in spending. Group B strep was a specific quality measure that was made part of their bundle. Uh, Geisinger reported improvements in uh, NICU admission for neonates and um, improvements in smoking cessation. Arkansas reported a small decrease in spending. Minnesota reported a small decrease in spending and Texas reported um, small gains in gestational age and birth weight, small but you know, likely clinically relevant. Um, but it's also likely that a lot of this is reporting bias. So there's a number of these programs for which there are no public data. And so understanding whether or not this is just the play of chance or whether these represent real potential for these types of models, I think is, um, is unknown. And we really don't know whether or not these programs improved equity. There's not enough detail in the published studies. And frankly, it wasn't an explicit goal for many of the earlier programs, though, though some of the most recent ones have included equity as a specific focus, it really wasn't on the radar even when some of these things were, were initiated, unfortunately. And so we data weren't even collected in a way that make it feasible to understand the equity uh, implications of these models. And of course, there are limitations. So bundles are not population health. If you think about the fact that um, uh, a pregnancy represents a specific event and we're appropriately focused on that event during this, uh, during this um, uh, event, uh, but it happens in a context that's much more broad, both sort of in the, the context around the individual, but also in their life course. And I've you know, certainly learned a lot about this from Ebony Carter, who I know is speaking in a different session, but about the, the degree to which the, the, the before and after is not just a short before and after, it's a long before and after. And bundles are not population health. So health homes, accountable care, other population health-based models are probably more promising in terms of improving care before, between, and after pregnancy via chronic disease management. And so thinking about bundling for pregnancy is certainly important, but it also needs to link to a recognition um, that women's health is not only important when they're pregnant, um, and that women's health is a crucial thing to improve throughout the life course, uh, and, and perhaps one of the more important things we can do to improve pregnancy outcomes. Bundles also don't necessarily address social risk factors. So much of what determines health outcomes, as we've discussed, is related to social risk, and the incentives to invest in addressing that are less in shorter models that are part of a limited life stage. Um, uh, broader models may incent an investment in broader social determinants, as opposed to sort of a Band-Aid type fix, thinking around transportation. Important, but not fundamentally going to change, um, change long-term outcomes. 
And uh, bundles may not be accessible to community based organizations. So, as I mentioned before, if current models rely on the typical medical approach to pregnancy care, they may not be centered in communities. They may not be centered where people um, are going to do best in terms of being able to distribute the resources that do come into the medical establishment out to where people need to receive their care um, will require some intentionality when it comes to thinking through how payment models can improve equity. So, a few thoughts about how bundles might be leveraged to improve equity. So, I guess the, the positive flip side of the negatives that I just brought up. You could require as part of a bundle, for example, if you're a state Medicaid agency, that in order for a clinician or a group of clinicians to receive a particular bundled payment model or an enhanced payment model, they must measure and address social risk. They must partner with communities. There are things you can actually incent being done in order to be able to receive an enhanced payment. Um, and if we are intentional about the equity implications of those things, um, we could uh, potentially leverage community supports as opposed to make them um, further and farther away. You could institute a requirement to follow best practices around anti-racism and inclusion. And, and this is a shifting landscape, I would say, in, in many ways, and an importantly shifting landscape. Uh, but a place where we don't necessarily know best practices for all situations, but one where that can be an intentional part of, again, participation in some sort of an enhanced bundle. There can be a requirement to integrate mental health care. That's currently much better done in, for example, FQHCs, where there is a requirement to do that uh, than, in, than in many other primary care clinics, for example. And so um, sort of setting up the structural incentives up front can be a powerful way to, uh, to improve the approach. Um, you can recognize social risk factors and pay accordingly. So instead of saying that we're going to pay a lump sum that's the same across all patients, you can pay more for people who have high social risk, creating an incentive to find and treat high risk patients instead of avoid them. We should pursue stratified reporting of quality measures so that we could start to address um, racial inequities in outcomes that are rooted in part in differences in the quality of care received um, and in, in those things that are external to the patient where we um, should not be blaming the patient for differences. We should be thinking about what we can do as clinicians to change the, um, the quality of the care that we deliver. We'll never know that if we don't disaggregate data. And also, bundles should be longer. I mean, you know, the, the uh, extension of Medicaid to one-year postpartum as included in the American Rescue Plan, um, I think, reflects the fact that the, the sort of arbitrary cutoff of care postpartum doesn't make any sense for women's life course health, for babies, um, for for anyone who is um, who is trying to stay in the best health possible, and so thinking about the broader ways that this intersects with health policy, I think, are also crucial. So the knowledge gaps are many. Uh, we don't know if bundles will work to improve equity in postpartum outcomes. Um, we actually don't know if bundles work to improve equity in other conditions and populations. We have some idea that in um, some medical and surgical conditions, they can uh, help improve efficiency but none have really been shown to powerfully improve outcomes, I think in part because they haven't been leveraged around things like social risk in broader care teams and in care coordination. We also don't know if adding population health tools to bundles leads to a broader impact on outcomes. Things like integrating mental health care or extending coverage are really crucial to thinking that any of this is gonna, is gonna change things, right? Payment models are a tool. They're, they're not helpful in and of themselves. They're just a way to build some of these things into a medical system that has historically been quite slow to change. Um, and so we, we really don't know whether or not these things will lead to meaningful changes in outcomes, but um, given the potential for uh, population approaches to really move the needle in a meaningful way, I think it's worth thinking through how we could address these rigorously. So key recommendations, I think demonstration programs should be studied with rigor and with resources. A lot of these wonderful programs are done in the community without on shoestring budgets without sustainable resources. And that's really um, that's really problematic. And it's not the way that we're going to ultimately improve outcomes. And so we need to resource where people are doing good work. We need to listen to people that are doing good work. We also need to figure out what people are doing um, so that we can um, figure out what's sustainable, what's um, what's scalable. We need an explicit focus on equity. We need quantitative and qualitative work, and we need patient voices included. Um, we need cost quality outcomes, but also patient experience understood in, in how we put these models together. 
I think learning collaboratives between state Medicaid agencies that focus on payment models for peri and postpartum outcomes could be particularly helpful because a lot of states are having these conversations right now um, with their Medicaid managed care organizations, uh, with their own funders, et cetera, et cetera. And of course, we need longer term data to determine the effect of receiving high quality uh, peripartum and postpartum care on future pregnancies, which is to say we should honor the entire life course. Um, even though pregnancy is an important touch point, we should really think about the connections uh, broadly to keeping people healthy. And that's all I have. Thank you very much. I'm honored to be part of this. Wonderful. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Dr. Maddox. It was great also to have a policy discussion as part of this session. Uh, so thank you very much. Um, okay, we're now going to move to our last speaker in this session, Dr. Wallace. And who's going to be talking on social and structural underpinnings of pregnancy associated mortality in the United States and Dr. Wallace, um, you have till 315 and then just a quick reminder to the speakers in the session who came before the break. We're going to bring you all back together again to have the discussion with the panel chair at 315. So don't go anywhere. Thank you. Dr. Wallace. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you so much. It's so wonderful to be here with you all today. I'm going to try and be brief. I want to honor the, the discussion. Um, that'll be really rich after this and of course our need for a, a real break <laughs> so um, again wonderful to be here to share my thoughts on social and structural underpinnings of pregnancy associated mortality in the u.s you might note i've used underpinnings there instead of determinants um, which is a word i'm sort of trying to get away from and that it's um, too deterministic for lack of a better word but i'm curious for thoughts about that so I have no uh, information to disclose. All of my opinions are my own. <clears throat> so as you're all aware, <clears throat> at this point, um, the maternal mortality rates in the US are high, continue to rise annually, and are shaped by vast and persistent racial inequities uh, in the experience of loss. So this figures from the CDC's 2020 report showing the increase across years from uh, 2018 when they uh, resumed reporting of maternal mortality. Uh, so not only have we seen increases here, but the latest 2020 data are showing even larger increases again and um, exacerbation of racial inequity. And so as we've been talking all day today, and, and wonderful um, speakers have been so, you know, so beautifully making this point, it, it's not that it's not for a lack of uh, spending on medical care or advancements in our medical technologies and treatments or efforts to improve quality of clinical care. Um, and enhanced surveillance of maternal deaths, we've been doing all of them. And yes, and yet we still see this trend. Um, and so it's, it's certainly not for any biological or inherent differences between people. Um, that point was driven home um, so beautifully by Dr. Bridges again yesterday. So rather, uh, my point that I want to emphasize today is that why we see this persistence and worsening of these trends is really that they are a reflection of our historically embedded societal values. And these values guide our decisions, our collective decisions around who matters, what issues rise to the level of care and concern uh, that we all think warrant a commitment of our own resources to address. So I think as researchers, I'm an epidemiologist, I'm a, I'm a maternal health researcher, and I think I'm you know, guilty of this as well. We've all been too slow uh, or narrowly focused to think beyond the medical model and move beyond the biomedical model to ask really innovative research questions that approach maternal mortality as a broad indicator of population health and well-being. Every single maternal death that happens in this country is part of and inseparable from the context in which it occurred. And I think of maternal mortality as sort of the canary in the coal mine of this country, where racial and economic and gender oppression continue to define who has power. And that means the power to become healthy, to maintain health, to have a healthy pregnancy and postpartum experience um, and across the life course, and then who does not. So I think that innovative research can continue, and it's really important that it does uh, pursue identification of physiologic etiologies that are underlying cases of maternal death. Um, obviously, more research needed to improve quality um, clinical care and systems of care. Um, but I think you know, we can move beyond silos and thinking about both and, um, meaning that in addition to those pieces, we need to at the same time consider with equal relevance the lived experience of pregnant people and their social interactions, features of the, features of the uh, place where women are born, live, and work, 
the policies that shape those places as protective or harmful to health, and the very structure and functioning of our society that dictates, again, the distribution of power and resources across people and places. So for an example today, I sort of, or an exemplar, I wanted to share with you briefly some of our research on access to maternity care, um, which we know has been declining. Sorry, I'm sorry, I'm seeing the messages about my audio. I'm gonna try to speak up. <clears throat> um, so sharing you with you briefly about uh, this study we did on access to maternity care, um, which has been declining in, in counties across the country. Um, and these data are um, thanks to a series of reports published by the March of Dimes. Um, and these reports identify so-called maternity care deserts. So these are counties where there's no hospital, no birthing center that offers maternity care, and no OBGYNs or midwives. So this is a map from the 2022 report showing how things looked using 2020 data. So um, with what might be the most obvious research question ever, we asked to what degree is living in a maternity care desert associated with adverse maternal health outcomes? Um, and so we used data from Louisiana, uh, all verified maternal deaths occurring in this state. And we found that living in a maternity care desert is associated with a threefold greater risk of death due to obstetric causes, almost a twofold greater risk of death from any cause during pregnancy and up to one year postpartum. And thirdly, we found, you know, really critically importantly, that the, the racial inequity in risk of death persisted even after controlling for whether or not the county was a maternity care desert. So we still saw that black pregnant and postpartum people were about twice as likely to die during pregnancy and up to one year postpartum, regardless of where in the state that they lived. So what this means is that you know, most obviously, maternity care is critically important. Um, there's no doubt about that. So it's such an important piece of this puzzle to ensure healthy pregnancy and postpartum experiences. Um, geographic access to care is so important to be able to quickly address obstetric emergencies should they arise. Um, but it also means that maternity care is a critical window of opportunity to prevent non-obstetric causes of death. A lot of my uh, other work is on homicide of pregnant and postpartum women. And we recognize that maternity care is, is such a, a unique opportunity to identify women who might be experiencing violence in the home, um, women suffering with mental health or substance use issues, um, to, it, the opportunity to identify and refer these, these folks to treatment um, when they might other not be in touch with services um, outside of their pregnancy experience. Um, it's, a real, it's a really important piece. Um, it also then, though, means that while ensuring access to maternity care is an, such an important step for maternal mortality prevention, it alone is insufficient in assuring maternal health equity. So this, this piece of the finding really extends the problem to larger structural and policy issues at play outside of the healthcare system and outside of the narrow time in people's lives, which they may be pregnant or recently postpartum. So thinking across, again, across the life course. Uh, some evidence from our team and some others in the literature identify and, ha and have you know, started to build up and identify some of these broader social and structural forces associated with the trends and inequities in maternal mortality that we continue to see in this country, including things like income inequality, violence, structural racism, issues with health care beyond geographic access, so beyond the maternity care desert piece, but uh, things like affordability of care, medical racism or discriminatory treatment, you know, just because you have act geographic access to care doesn't mean that when you walk in the door, um, it's gonna be affordable or acceptable to you. Um, structural racism more broadly within our society and increasing threats to bodily autonomy and the right to abortion care. Um, so there was a great piece out in the New York Times, I think it was about four years ago now, um, although still, still relevant, unfortunately, uh, it profiles the experiences of, of Simone, who's pictured here with her children. She's a woman uh, from New Orleans, where I live and work, and, it, and this, her story really demonstrates, sort of, it, you know, sort of um, distills how some of these really big picture societal issues can play out and in, 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 in manifest in individual people's lives and impact their own ability to be healthy and to stay healthy um, during pregnancy and other times. So, in addition to thinking more broadly or, or, or urging us to think more broadly about underlying causes of maternal mortality, 
I also want to urge us that there's this a need to think beyond maternity as an isolated or siloed experience. And understanding it as one possible condition uh, within the spectrum of comprehensive reproductive experiences. So as you all I know are well aware, the Supreme Court ruling this year that overturned the constitutional right to abortion resulted in laws in many states that um, triggered the almost immediate closure of some or all remaining clinics providing abortion care. So we have here now in places that were already maternity care deserts, a total absence of com comprehensive reproductive health care services, which I think we can start to understand how this might doubly jeopardize the health of persons who cannot access abortion care to terminate an unwanted pregnancy and cannot access maternity care when they're forced to carry a pregnancy to term. So my team uh, and I are starting to look at um, the, sort of the population health consequences of this uh, sort, of, sort of double jeopardy. So to summarize where I think there are some really critical knowledge gaps are not only research questions that illuminate social structural policy reasons underlying persistently high rates of maternal mortality, but really more importantly, moving towards intervention and identification of effective interventions to address these causes. You know, we can document associations with social inequities and root causes um, with, of maternal mortality over and over again, you know, refining rigorous empirical analyses but I think we can't, A, we can't stop there, and we can't continue to wait without action. So um, really moving towards intervention and, um, and, and translating our findings, um, and, and also not, not waiting on you know, perfecting a causal model before we pr uh, promote an agenda that's really going to support um, women and pregnant people's health and right to health. Um, it's been over a decade now since the World Health Organization recognized the social determinants of health. Um, and yet we still see the persistence and worsening of health inequities. And so, um, you know, I think it, it's wonderful that we're moving more in that direction, although it's been a long time now, and I think um, we, we need to, to, to really focus now on the translation of this knowledge into tangible political action. Um, I think, thirdly, that the increasingly critical role that we are seeing state policies play um, is, is a really important one to focus on now. I mean, state policies are shaping social context and economic con context and access to health care in ways that make us really look more like a collection of countries than a United States, um, with how vastly different those contexts are across states. And those differences are resulting in measurable changes in the reproductive health outcomes and inequities across states. Um, so we can, so we, we can actually see the impacts happening in real time. And then again, I think we are we are unfortunately overdue in this, but really time to emphasize the critical importance of comprehensive reproductive health care services to maternal health and maternal mortality prevention. Um, I think unfortunately now we have you know been put in this position to really consider the implications of declining access to these services, including abortion and other constraints on bodily autonomy that might infringe on the human right to health, regardless of if and when a person chooses to. So key recommendations for what could be done to fill these knowledge gaps that I mentioned. I think developing a greater understanding of the policy and political processes that have been constraining action or perhaps that could enable action on social and structural determinants of health is needed. Again, we've known these things for a long time. Let's move into action and understand uh, how, to, how to enable that action. Conducting experimental or quasi-experimental, really rigorous population health research that can identify effective interventions that target these really high level or really upstream determinants at, at structural and policy levels. Supporting the implementation of concrete and effective interventions that are already known to protect maternal health. So again, not waiting um, for, for, you know, for the, the, the perfect causal model, but here, here let's really prioritize and listen to impact communities to see what might already be working and move it into more action. So thank you for speaking with you today and I'll, I'll stop there. Wonderful, thank you so much, Dr. Wallace. I would like to now invite all speakers back from this session um, for a discussion with Dr. Karina Davidson and the panel chair. So that means we will start with Dr. Um, Plotter AC all the way down through the session. Thanks. 
to join my thanks as well. Those were an incredible six talks. I know for the audience and for the panel members, um, that was a lot of information to digest as it was a long session. Um, just to orient you this time, I think what I'm going to do is just try and um, uh, go through each speaker sequentially, rather than just asking for open questions um, to help you organize your thoughts. I know we have some audience questions for each person, but I'm gonna start right up at the top um, with Dr. Slaughter AC. And um, I know um, Dr. Braveman has one question from the panel for her. So uh, Paula, if you could join us and ask your question. Hello. First, I just I want to congratulate all of the all of the presenters and the NIH staff who recruited them and determined what uh, the, the foci of the of the talks. I wanted to um, just briefly touch on a uh, a definition definitional issue, and this came up in the first talk, and it also came up in the last talk, where at times um, social and structural were contrasted with each other. Um, and I think that's a mistake, it, uh, and I think that most people in the field, um, the way that we look at it is that the social determinants of health, the social factors that um, influence health, uh, that, that that's a very broad uh, category. And you've got within that category, you have upstream determinants and midstream determinants and downstream determinants. And so the, I'm assuming that what um, first and the last speaker might have been referring to, when you referred to social, I would say that talking about kind of midstream determinants. Uh, and contrasting structural with uh, with social, and I, I think we'll do better at keeping the um, the issue of how important the structural determinants are if we make sure that they're they're included as the most upstream uh, most upstream examples of social social determinants. Curious about whether uh, there's any response to that. Hi, this is Maeve. I can respond. I don't know if Dr. Slaughter AC is on. Um, let's respond. Just kind of jump in ahead of her. See her, so please. Okay. Yeah, so yeah, I, I guess I, I utilize the WHO's conceptual framework for action on structural and social determinants of health. And just as you said, they define structural determinants as farther upstream from social determinants. So really broad things like governance, um, policy, cultural and societal norms and values that shape the distribution of social determinants of health across um, people and places. And so, um, yes, I, I mean, it's, yeah farther upstream, which I think is was the point that you made. Do we have either Dr. Butler or Dr. Slaughter AC able from the EPC able to address this comment? Yes, thank you. Um, thank you for the question. And I will say that um, during the development of the of the report and um, in many conversations within the team and within uh, uh, Discussions with our with our NIH partners as we were developing uh, developing the report. There was a lot of conversation about a lot of language, um, and this is one of them. Um, and it's one of the reasons why we included that uh, uh, the picture of the of the Williams framework that uh, Dr. Slaughter AC um, had also adapted uh, to be able to um, address this uh, topic a little bit more directly. And it, it also takes that position of um, further upstream and further downstream. Um, and yet there are there are still a lot of people who relate to the terms of social um, as as an earlier form and then the structural needing to to really make sure it was included to directly address the structural institutional um, 
um, impacts of, of things. And so uh, that was one of the reasons why in the report itself, we were using this, this um, social stru dash structural or structural dash um, social determinants so that um, we were trying to communicate across the wide range of audiences that relate to the to this information from the language sets that they themselves talk between. So I think that there's a lot of um, um, sympathy and resonance um, with with this idea, and the challenge is is how do we how do we talk about this in a way that we're reach, reaching the widest set of audiences. I don't know if that is an adequate answer, um, but at least it helps you see the thought process that we were undergoing as we were um, addressing the report. That's definitely relevant. Um, I point out that if you sort of remove the structural determinants from the social determinants, then you don't have racism as a social determinant. Of you know, it's just the thinking through what the co what the consequences might be, because I think intellectually it's defensible to approach it in either way. Um, but I think if we look at where the it's sort of the judgment about where the bigger dangers are, but it but it, it's clear that you've been very you've been thoughtful about this, and that's good. Okay, uh, any other questions from panel members for um, on the topic of the evidence based practice center of completion of key question 1. Okay, then I will move to the next uh, topic, which was implementation science and its roles in achieving perinatal health by Dr. Simon. Um, any panel members with questions or comments for Dr. Simon? See one in the chat. Are there any data showing that implicit bias trainings are effective? Not really, especially not in maternal health. So that's why I said we need some information. We need some research on some of these state level laws for implicit bias training. I know California, for example, is trying to collect some data on on what are what is the impact of um, some of these trainings that are being state mandated. Um, but I mean, I, I agree that we can't train ourselves out of racism. I 150% agree with Ebony and others. Um, uh, but is there, is there some kind of influence that these trainings have? Perhaps there is, and perhaps there isn't, but, you know, tra training is not the, the box to check and say, okay, I'm not racist anymore because I've taken the training. That's baloney. And there's another question for you um, out of the chat box, which is um, what type of study should be funded to move the field forward? RCT versus adaptive design, hybrid effectiveness, et cetera. Have you got any general recommendations back out to the audience? I would say all of the above. I think everything needs to be done. Like I, like I showed that very complicated um, way of a map of addressing what it would take to address the obesity epidemic. It's gonna be a complicated set of uh, interventions and programs and studies of policies, um, implementation of policies that are gonna take us to the next step of advancing maternal health or health, um, health equity. And so, yes, to all of the different designs that everything that we need, um, many different types of designs and many different uh, to, to identify in best practices and implementation of many different types of programs, policies and interventions um, and, and approaches to healthcare delivery, perinatal care and postpartum care delivery in order to move the field forward. So whatever design that's complementary of what you, topic you're trying to advance or study is critical. So that's why we need more scientists and teams who can do these different types of studies. Right. Okay, I'm gonna move to the next topic, midwifery in a FQHC birth center model utilizing a reproductive justice framework. 
And so for Dr. Marcel, are there any questions from the panel members? If not, I have a few from the audience. The first one is, do you have a good training program you use for perinatal care coordinators? I think that we're all just trying to figure it out. I think we looked at what had been done successfully and looking at like community health workers, um, programs that have been like really strong, like Health One Connect. Um, I think the challenge has been, again, like these positions are usually grant funded and you've got to do what the grant is asking you to do and you're limited to what the, gr the grant is allowing. And so um, I think we've done a pretty decent job, but you know, for me, the ultimate goal, the ultimate dream was that um, we aren't funding these positions off of grants and then we can really, really develop it and grow it. Right, and I think that segues nicely into the second question uh, posed for you. Is there any hope for understanding what maternity care models work best? and ensuring that they are standard and widely available. I mean, I hope so. I hope that everybody can have a midwife, but not just a midwife, a doula, a lactation consultant. Like I want I want us to reframe like who has and who doesn't. Um, and so I, I, I hope so. I, I'm still in the good fight for it. <laughs> um, but, you know, it's it's challenging, you know, I. 15 minutes wasn't long enough for me to discuss, you know, funding, um, reimbursement, midwifery legislation. Um, you know, it's it's a lot. And yeah. so um, is it so overwhelming that I'm not going to keep fighting? Absolutely not. But um, it just requires right now that I run around the country and say the system is broken. <laughs> and, and on that note, uh, the third question was if um, I think to provide you with a couple more minutes to describe the model of postpartum care that you are doing. Oh, great. Yes. So um, we were awarded the Hillman grant um, and it was a nurse led program that um, addresses systemic racism. And so our idea was to create a innovative postpartum program that extends across the year with a combination of home based care, um, peer led groups and also um, continued appointments throughout that first year, thinking that, you know, we can ease the process into good primary care, continue to have that touch, continue to have that continuity and be more supportive during that postpartum period. Um, because honestly, like postpartum is forever. It's not, you know, six to eight weeks. So um, again, really pushing the needle and again, this is a grant, you know, um, the next le part is going to be figuring out how to pay for it and create, make it sustainable, but just really, really hoping that um, there is more support for innovation and doing things differently. Right. Thank you so much. So moving to the next talk, pregnancy care and outcomes in incarcerated settings. Um, do panel members have any questions or comments? I know there's one in the audience. Um, uh, there's a question for you, Dr. Suffren, is much known about what happens to the children of people who give live birth while incarcerated. Great question. And the short answer is no. Um, there is research um, on the effects of parental incarceration uh, for children, um, but uh, in general, but not really much that is specific to infants born to people in custody. Um, I will in a moment put a, an article in the chat um, uh, by Rebecca Schlieffer and Rachel Hardiman that does review the very limited data that exists. Um, there, there is a little bit of data um, that comes from studies of so-called prison nursery programs or mother infant care programs where incarcerated birthing people uh, bring their, their babies back to the prison with them. There's a special wing of the prison. Um, there's actually been an increase in interest and in legislation in states to, to create these programs. Um, I'm not, I, I'm not convinced that we have data to show that this is where we should be investing our money into building more institutions of incarceration. Um, these, the eligibility for these programs are very stringent and, um, it would, uh, 
families might be better served in the community, um, especially if people meet those stringent requirements for the prison nursery programs. But those few studies of prison nursery programs show that um, infants who um, reside co-located with their with their um, their mothers in prison do have improved um, behavioral outcomes at two years and um, as well as uh, improved attachment. And then other studies have shown, not surprisingly, that infants and children with incarcerated parents go on to have um, higher rates of substance use, um, uh, academic uh, disadvantages and delays, um, and, uh, and other attachment issues as well. And that parental incarceration overall is considered to be an adverse childhood experience. Great, thank you. And I know we're at time and probably everyone's craving their actual 15 minute break. So the final question I'm gonna uh, pose jointly to uh, doctors Maddox and uh, Wallace. There's a audience member who is wondering if you could um, speak to a little bit about uh, payment systems and um, injustices that are focused specifically on um, uh, teens uh, who are going through pregnancy and then postpartum, as of course that's a, a intersectional group that we haven't spent enough time on during these two days. I will defer that question to my colleague because I actually don't know of any. Um, it's not to say there aren't, but it's it's not an area that I'm familiar enough with to to answer. Um, and I, I definitely won't answer with regard to payment models. That's not going to fix. But um, I, I think uh, when I think about adolescents, I, I think about sort of again this intersection of co comprehensive reproductive health care services. I and mean, we've looked at um, parental involvement laws for teens um, who are seeking abortion and how um, that can be such a difficult um, piece of care for them to receive and, and to maintain their own bodily autonomy. Um, we also see adolescents are at huge risk for maternal homicide, which I mentioned is my other um, area of research. And so it's so important for this group in particular to be able to control um, decisions around if and when to become pregnant. And of course, all the social and structural determinants that might underlie why a teen uh, might experience an unintended or unwanted pregnancy, uh, more so with someone that has more societal power and resources at their disposal. Great. Thank you again so much for the, the, the wealth of information that you have shared with us today. Um, with that, we're having a 15 minute break. Uh, so we'll, so again, if you stay, if everyone can stay on the um, system, just mute and we'll come back in 15 minutes. Thanks everyone. Okay, welcome back everyone. It is 345, so we'll get started with our last afternoon session, uh, which is on key question two, which I will read briefly. Um, immediately before or immediately after delivery and before release from birthing related care, what combinations of risk indicators to the birthing person have the greatest effect on poor postpartum health outcomes? So we are now switching over to key question two. But first, before we do that, we invited um, Dr. Ian Saldana from Brown University Heaven's Face Practice Center to present on uh, the results of an evidence review that were not commissioned for this P2P workshop, but that were being completed um, in similar in a similar time frame. And the results are just so strongly related that we thought it would be worth inviting Dr. Saldana to present the results uh, to this audience uh, and to the independent panel. And then after he does that, we will then jump into our key question to speakers. So, Dr. Saldana, go right ahead. Great. Thank you, Kate. And thank you, the organizers, for the opportunity and for everyone for attending today. 
Um, so as was said, I'm at the Brown Evidence-Based Practice Center in, in Providence, and we were um, asked to do this systematic review on, on postpartum care. Um, in terms of funding, so this review was funded by the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality and the Patient-Centered Outcomes Research Institute. Um, I'm the lead of the project that we are describing, but other than the project, um, I don't have relevant disclosures to report for myself or any of the team members. Um, and as um, it, um, none of anything I said is um, should be construed as an official position of AH, either AHRQ or PCORI. So um, I'm here on behalf of a team that um, conducted this systematic review at the Brown University and our colleagues at UNC. You've heard from Dr. Allison Stube already, um, University of Michigan and Yale, and with gratitude to our funders and uh, our partners on the project, the American College of Obstetrics and Gynecology. So this is a systematic review and meta-analysis that's designed to inform the ACOG, American College of Obstetrics and Gynecology Clinical Practice Guideline on care of individuals a year, up to a year after delivery. Uh, the systematic review is ongoing. We've, a draft version of the systematic review is publicly posted now and is, will be revised once we receive comments from um, the public. So, uh, as part of this systematic review, there are two key questions that we addressed. Um, it, these, these key questions are different from the key questions that we are talking about in um, this workshop. But for the purpose of my presentation, key question one is what healthcare delivery strategies affect postpartum care utilization and improve maternal outcomes within one year of postpartum? Um, what we were Targeting as part of this review is a population of studies that have addressed a population of individuals of any age that are within the first year after giving birth. Um, either studies that address the healthy general population or subsets of the population that may be at increased risk of complications due to pregnancy related conditions, such as hypertensive disorders or due to incident and newly diagnosed conditions that may occur postpartum that may put them at additional risk. Um, we were interested in studies that address general postpartum care or specific aspects of postpartum care, like contraceptive care, breastfeeding, screening, and other preventive care. So as part of key question one, the one that was about delivery strategies, uh, we uh, that is about delivery strategy, we are, strategies, we are interested in various aspects of delivery strategies that are listed here, such as where care is delivered, for example, hospital versus clinic, how care is delivered, whether it's dedicated postpartum visit or part of a wild child visit, when care is delivered, for example, at two weeks versus six weeks, who provides care, whether it be individuals like postpartum, I mean, like obstetrics and gynecologists, or it might be community support, such as doulas and other uh, peer support, uh, healthcare coordination and management, such as use of patient navigators, uh, information and communication technology, such as bi-directional texting or apps, we're also interested in interventions that are targeted not at the patients, but at the healthcare providers, so indirectly targeted at the patients, either the providers or the systems, such as clinical decision support tools. That was key question one. Key question two, we were interested in does extension of uh, health insurance coverage or improvements in access to care affect postpartum healthcare utilization and improve maternal outcomes within one year of postpartum. So this one is specifically about insurance and access to care. So for both key questions, we, are we were interested in randomized controlled trials that have addressed any of um, the question, as long as they were had at least 10 participants per group and non-randomized studies, as long as they were comparative, either prospective or retrospective, as long as they had um, 30, at least 30 participants per group. Um, for in the interest of being most applicable to the United States setting, we included studies for key question one, the one about delivery strategies, provided they were conducted in the US or in Canada. And for key question two, which was about insurance, we were interested in studies only, conduct, only studies conducted in the US. 
So a brief summary of our methods, these are fairly standard methods as far as AHRQ methodology for systematic reviews goes. Um, we search for published evidence. Our evidence that's currently posted publicly is up to date as of December last year. Um, we recently updated the search and are in, in the process of incorporating the updated evidence in the revised version that will be um, revised after public review. Um, so we are now, we've screened the evidence for eligibility, we've extracted data, we evaluated the evidence using contemporary tools to assess the risk of bias. And then once we look across studies that have addressed individual outcomes, we looked at the strength of that body of evidence. And then we use a range of criteria that are used, such as consistency, precision, directness, and so on, to come up with the conclusions regarding insufficient evidence where we cannot make conclusions that you'll notice that color in gray later on, and then low, moderate, and high strengths of evidence, um, which reflect the confidence that we have in the estimate or the results that are um, summarized. Um, we also conducted syntheses of the evidence narratively and quantitatively using meta-analyses. So what did we find? So for key question one about delivery strategies, uh, we found 54 studies in total that met our criteria, out of which 45 are randomized trials and nine were non-randomized comparative studies. Um, the risk of bias was, um, for, for the bulk of them, was either moderate or high, as you see here. For key question two, which was 16 studies, they were all non-randomized comparative studies. Again, the risk of bias for the bulk was moderate or high, or for all the evidence there. So for key question one, that's about healthcare delivery strategies. I know there's not a, not a lot of numbers here in this matrix. So the, in the first column, you have the delivery strategies that I listed out earlier that were, were of interest. Um, and then the columns are the aspects of care that, that the interventions were targeting. So whether it was general postpartum care on that first column, and then the next three columns getting at contraceptive care, breastfeeding care, and screening or preventive care. If you squint your eyes a little bit, you see the bulk of the numbers here are in, or a good proportion of the numbers are in the contraceptive care and the breastfeeding care columns, with some studies in the general postpartum care column and fewer studies in the screening of preventive care column. So I'm going to start to show you some of the results. Um, there's a lot of results, and in the interest of time, what I'm going to do is focus on the ones where we're able to make some conclusions and point out some of the gaps. I'm going to focus less on the breastfeeding and, um, and um, contraceptive care outcomes and more on the maternal outcomes here. So this is for key question one, which was where healthcare is delivered. We found 10 studies. Um, the gray, just to remind you, is where we cannot make a conclusion because the evidence was insufficient. So for example, the outcomes of interest are listed here on that left side column, which is healthcare utilization outcomes attendance at postpartum visits, unplanned care utilization, adherence of screening, transition to care providers, and so on. So the only conclusion that we were able to make that's pink or higher color um, is the ones in the two rows there. That's unplanned care utilization and mental health. So um, as far as where healthcare deli is delivered, um, the, the horizontal sort of squiggly line there, that tilde, gets suggests that the, in terms of um, in terms of when you compare home versus pediatric clinic delivery of breastfeeding care, we found four studies. The results for these suggested that the hospital admissions were comparable and other unplanned care were comparable. That, that in other words, the, where that care was delivered for breastfeeding care did not impact those outcomes. Similarly, for mental health, where the care was delivered did not impact the long, longer term mental health outcomes of those patients. So these were outcomes that we were interested in uh, for our review. The ND suggests that there were no data so that we identified addressing those outcomes, suggesting that there were gaps in terms of what we know about how where care is delivered may impact maternal mortality, quality of life, perceived stress, and in terms of harms, whether there were worsening in health inequities and reported discrimination. So that was about where. Um, what, for this question, we were able to do a meta-analysis. I know there's a lot going on in this figure. Essentially, what this is showing is that there were four 
four studies that we have identified for um, the outcome of hospital readmission for whether the care was delivered in the hospital, in the home or in the clinic, suggesting that the relative risk here suggesting is 1.38 with a confidence interval that crosses one comfortably 0.9 to 2.13, suggesting that there's no evidence of a difference in that terms of that outcome by the three month time point. So that's the aspect of where in terms of how. Um, Sure, too, you see quite a lot of gaps. There's a lot of no data. There's a lot of gray colors suggesting that there was insufficient evidence. So we couldn't make conclusions about um, healthcare utilization. But in terms of clinical outcomes for maternal care, um, for mental health, whether care was conducted in an integrated fashion, we're suggesting that uh, with multiple providers being uh, available at once or uh, uh, in the same setting. Um, versus a non-integrated care, there was no difference in terms of patient outcomes for depression and substance use and other um, for those two mental health outcomes, but quite a lot of gaps for this as well. Um, in terms of who provides care, um, the bulk of the evidence that addressed who provides care focused on breastfeeding. So you can see here for general care, in terms of who provides general care, um, there was not as much evidence for us to go on in terms of ran RCTs or non-randomized studies, but we were able to make conclusions of, in terms of breastfeeding care, in terms of who provides breastfeeding care, the, the, the up arrows in this, in this row of breastfeeding care, the nine studies regarding breastfeeding care by peer supporters, but, and the seven studies for lactation consultant, there was, there was evidence that th these, um, these providers of breastfeeding care, um, having peer support and having lactation consultant helped improve, helped improve most of the breastfeeding outcomes in terms of whether or not the patient breastfed after a while. I'm not going to get into those details um, um, for in the interest of time. But there was evidence of a benefit for the use of these uh, providers. In terms of care coordination of management, such as patient navigators, we just found a couple of studies and could not make any conclusions, unfortunately, um, for um, these um, for this aspect. In terms of information and communication technology use. Uh, there were, we found some studies that were able, we were able to make conclusions again about breastfeeding, but that the use of information or communication technology for the delivery of breastfeeding care uh, did not make an impact on, um, on any breastfeeding at three or six months postpartum and exclusive breastfeeding. So that um, is a key question one. That is interventions targeting, uh, I'm sorry, there's one more aspect of key question one, which is interventions targeting the healthcare providers. Unfortunately, we found a couple of studies, but there weren't enough data in those studies for the outcomes that we prioritize for our review. Um, so we couldn't make any conclusions there. And finally, key question two, that's health insurance extension. Uh, we found a total of 16 studies and we found more studies more recently in this updated search. Um, but there is moderate strength of evidence there in that top row that having extend insurance extension of various kinds evaluated in these very studies, I don't have the chance uh, time to get into too many of the details, but more comprehensive longer term insurance um, has shows benefit in terms of greater attendance at postpartum visits. All right, so this is at a glance for both key questions. So you see you have those same outcomes listed on the left here. And then I know there's a lot going on, but just, so, just to give you a flavor at a glance, in terms of looking down the columns here, the first set of seven columns are, are about um, key question one. You can see a lot of gaps, there's a lot of insufficient evidence. There's some evidence for um, contraceptive use and lactation consultants and so on. Um, but there's not a whole lot of conclusions that we could make, but for key question two, we could make a conclusion about more comprehensive insurance and attendance at postpartum visits. So if we take a step back and trying to evaluate the strengths of the evidence and what can we conclude from this and what, where are the gaps and what are the implications for research? So the strengths are that because of our focus on the US population and the Canadian population for key question one, um, there is good applicability of the, to the US decision-making context and I didn't have a chance to explore too much of the details, but the populations across these studies reflected a good amount of age and racial diversity in the populations. However, there are some important limitations. Um, 
In terms of the populations and intervention targets, there's limited data on general overall care. Um, a lot of the first evidence and conclusions we could make were based on specifically breastfeeding care or uh, contraceptive care. And especially this issue, I, I mean, and relatedly, um, for at risk populations, population, the bulk of the evidence was about general overall, I mean, healthy populations, but not enough about populations that are at greatest risk for, for example, health reasons. Um, so the bulk of the evidence, as I said, focused on um, specific targets of care, only 26% of the evidence was general. Um, in terms of delivery strategies, there's sparse evidence for IT or, uh, information technology use, coordination or management of care, and interventions targeting health providers. And very importantly, although the, the studies had a good amount of racial and uh, other types of diversity, unfortunately, differences by those different subgroups and what interventions might work better for certain subgroups was not adequately reported for us to make strong enough conclusions. Um, so, and for many of our outcomes of interest that we prioritize with our stakeholders, there wasn't enough data. And my, um, my second to last slide here, in terms of key question two, although we made a conclusion that um, health insurance extension improves in visit attendance, again, there are limited data on differences by population subgroups. For other outcomes outside visit attendance, there wasn't enough data. Um, but, but there is an opportunity here, as we've talked about at this uh, workshop. Um, there, with all the recent Medicare extensions in various states, it presents an excellent opportunity for researchers um, to evaluate the impact of those policy changes on postpartum care utilization, postpartum health, both within states and how things have, have improved within states, but also across states. And, and a very important question still remains unanswered by this uh, systematic review is, do and to what extent do these policy changes help reduce the racial and other disparities in postpartum outcomes in the US that we've been talking about? And finally, the implications of this work will that we may be able to make conclusions for some delivery strategies and for insurance, and, but, um, but wherever we were able to make conclusions, they were all low to moderate strength. You didn't see any of those dark colored conclusions that we've talked about, that I um, in, initially um, described in terms of high strength of evidence. Um, with that, I'll wrap up. Thank you for your attention and um, looking forward to the discussion. Wonderful. Thank you, Dr. Saldana. We appreciate it. Again, just recognizing that this evidence review was separate from the workshop, but the, you know, the topic was just so closely aligned. We appreciate you bringing the results to us. Yeah, sure. um, okay, we have four speakers left today who will now jump into key question two. They'll um, cover presentations on topics, including improving global maternal health, improving access to care and programs for high quality, high value and equitable care. And our first speaker is Dr. Flavia Bustrio. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, it's uh, really an honor to have the opportunity to speak uh, from Geneva, Switzerland. So forgive me, it's almost uh, it's past 10 p.m. So maybe the voice is not as strong. I hope you can hear me loud and clear. Yes, we can. <laughs> Thanks. So I have no information to disclose in relation to this uh, conversation. And my, the next slide, my focus will maybe be slightly different from many of the very interesting presentation that you have discussed during the day, because I'll try to share with you uh, a global overview of maternal mortality and maternal health and share what have been the progress, what have been the challenges and the promises ahead with the hope that some of those uh, uh, progress and challenges can be relevant uh, to the setting of the United States. Next slide. I will uh, take um, a lot of the material from this presentation from this report that we call Protect the Promises. That is uh, the 2022 progress report of the Global Strategy for Women, Children and Adolescent Health. This is a report compiled by the United Nations agencies uh, and with the leadership of the World Health Organization and the Partnership for Maternal and Newborn and Child Health, which I represent here. And it compiles the most recent data and trends 
giving an overview of the current status of health of women, children, and adolescents. And uh, this year, the reason is, is particularly interesting and it can be very relevant for uh, your conversation in the United States. It focuses a lot on the impact of the, what we call the triple C, the triple threat of COVID, climate change, and conflict on especially maternal mortality. Um, <clears throat> next slide, please. So if we look globally, we currently are at the status where we still have almost 300,000 women that died from complication of pregnancy and childbirth. And 34 of the 36 countries with the highest maternal mortality um, rates are in Sub-Saharan Africa. So this uh, maternal mortality is an indicator that is being linked with uh, really the highest inequity and is a manifestation of inequities, health inequities in the world, especially when we compare the woman lifetime risk of a maternal death that is one out of 37 in Sub-Saharan Africa compared to the risk that you have in North America, which is one out of 4,800. <clears throat> now, there is one point that is very important and relevant also for the, um, for the conversation that is 97% of unsafe abortion, which we will see is a key cause of maternal deaths, occur in developing countries and especially in Africa. The next slide, please. This uh, depicts uh, the um, estimates of maternal mortality ratio, dividing them in low, very low, high, and very high and extremely high. And as you can see, the continent, the, the sub-Saharan African countries especially are the countries where the concentration of the high mortality still remain, but we have uh, countries in Latin America with low, still low, and also the Indian subcontinent, although the mortality ratio is low, but we still have a, a very large number of maternal deaths. The next slide, please. The causes of maternal deaths, I would like to spend, uh, I draw your attention to the fact that clearly uh, the workshop is very focused on postpartum care, but I like to uh, pinpoint that globally, the causes of maternal deaths span from the traditional postpartum hemorrhage, but also hypertension, sepsis, particularly in many countries where the um, care time of delivery is not very um, very good yet. Of course, abortion, still 8% of maternal deaths are linked to abortion. And then a large proportion of maternal deaths globally are due to what we call indirect causes, which is, for example, um, diabetes, obesity, and those causes over time in the last two decades, we have seen globally an increase of those indirect causes of deaths. And so interrogation also in the US scenario of that distribution of deaths and how uh, that proportion has changed over time, I think is a critical element to um, analyze. The next slide, I will not spend a lot of time, but just to say that the US is an important um, analysis and your reflection are very important for the rest of the world because it's one of the few countries where uh, pregnancy-related mortality is increasing and also where you have documented extremely well the pregnancy-related mortality ratio by race, ethnicity, and also by urban-rural classification. So any of the research that uh, shed further light on this dimension of maternal mortality are very, very important for other countries as well. The next slide. Now, for many of you, I'm sure, are familiar of, with the Sustainable Development Goals, and a lot of my professional life has been dedicated to ensure that maternal mortality has been included in these Sustainable Development Goals, and particularly in the goal three that is related to health and well-being. And as you can see, there are two specific indicators and targets that are included by 2030 to reduce the global maternity ratio and also 
by 2030 to ensure universal access to sexual and reproductive health care services. And uh, <clears throat> unfortunately, the next slide, please. If we see the trends in the world when it comes to maternal mortality in the upper left quarter, you see that basically in the last 15 years, in the upper and middle high income countries, the trend is stagnating. And there's a few countries like in the US where we have seen uh, increases. The only uh, uh, small reduction is happening in the countries with uh, low income quintile. So that is a, a very, very hopeful part, but uh, still we are struggling with that uh, uh, stagnation of the reduction of maternal deaths. Now, reasons for that, next slide, are very clearly associated to the uh, gaps the persist in access to services essential to women and children's health. And especially, for example, if you look at this graph, aggregation of the very, very low still demand for family planning um, with and the access to modern contraception, also the antenatal care level still very low, and postnatal visits for mothers and postnatal visits for babies, for example. These are all elements of the where we still see that the coverage of those essential services have remained very low. I will skip the next slide in the interest of time to focus on the what why do we talk about the impact of the 3C? And I think this is particularly relevant also for the US um, context. Number one, uh, we have seen that the impact of COVID-19 pandemic has, will continue to negatively influence maternal health outcome. Next slide. How does it do that? The current evidence points that the increase in maternal mortality during the COVID pandemic, but this is not uniform across, across countries and also is not clear to what extent is increased these direct or indirect effects. Nevertheless, the risk of severe disease and deaths among pregnant and postpartum women with uh, um, COVID-19 infection appears to be higher. And then particularly women who are older from minority group and have comorbidities. And the research has also shown that there has been an increase in preterm birth a mission to neonatal care intensive care units and stillbirths among infants born to women that are COVID positive. <clears throat> the next one is a little bit of uh, next slide, please. Is uh, also demonstrating that one important aspect to look at the impact of COVID-19 on maternal deaths has been also the reduction of the key services for women and children in the, especially in the 2020 year, linked to the lockdown and many restrictions that were put in place by many countries. And since 2021, there is a slight increase that we are seeing, which is encouraging, but still, as I show in the, in the overarching slides, we are still far from having the coverage that we call universal coverage. Next slide. This is uh, something that uh, I think you have also addressed a little bit, but the impact of climate change on health and on health during pregnancy is directly via the environmental disasters, the wildfire, extreme heat, hurricane, flood and drought, but also directly uh, climate related uh, disasters are associated with increase risk of gestational complication, pregnancy losses, restrictive fetal growth, low birth weight, preterm birth. And also very important in the US, given the recent years experience, high temperature have been linked across the world to premature rupture of membranes, gestational cardiovascular events, gestational hypertension and preeclampsia, birth defects, and neonatal mortality. And, uh, Similarly, the impact of conflict and the growing food crisis, because this has impacted um, pregnant women in humanitarian and fragile setting that are at greater risk of birth complication 
and also the food crisis has impacted on the nutritional status of uh, women even before they become pregnant and that we know has an important impact uh, in the last two years. So next slide is uh, to interrogate what can be done to counter the problem. And these uh, suggestions are coming especially from the World Health Organization, which I had the pleasure to serve for many years, including as Assistant Director General for Family, Women and Children Health for more than 10 years. Next. So the first point that I'd like to make is that the nurturing care approach is an approach that looks at women's health before they become pregnant, before the conception, during the pregnancy, and also laying the foundation for child health and the early life exposure and experiences. And we have information and data from many, many countries that we need to structure health program that support that continuum of care, starting with antenatal care services, extending throughout the childhood and the period of adolescence. This care framework, yes, please, you can move to that. This, uh, the next slide. The nurturing care framework is very important and is also linked to the framework for ending preventable maternal mortality. And here I like to highlight the milestones that are critical for it, especially relevant for the United States scenario, the equity aspects addressing disparities in access to maternal, newborn and child care, the importance of accountability for the access or lack of access, and the milestone 10, the research, innovation, and knowledge exchange. And I really like to encourage that that happens across the states in the United States. And I saw that that was in the making during the workshop, but also using the opportunity to exchange with country outside the United States, because knowledge and practices can be very important. Next slide. One key aspect is the workforce. And the, here, the key message that I like to leave this group is the importance of the midwife-led continuity of care and how important it is that uh, midwives support a woman throughout the antenatal, intrapartum, and postnatal continuum. And despite this importance and recommendation by WHO, we still have a critical, critical gap in the number and the shortage of the midwives that are currently working across countries. The next slide, I will skip. <clears throat> the next one is for stressing the importance of supporting parents. This is a new WHO guidance that was really looking at how important it is that the government regulatory policy and entitlement should ensure families receive adequate financial and workplace support and have parental leaves and entitlements that can give, accommodate and address the special needs of mothers, fathers and other primary caregivers of uh, newborn babies. <clears throat> the next slide is uh, to stress the need for this multi-sectoral approach, which is at the center of what the partnership is doing and uh, a, a plea for you that are primarily academics and researchers to also work with other constituency in the society to address and redress this gap in maternal deaths and uh, work with the, gap, with the advocates, work with the adolescent and youth that are very vocal on these aspects and of course uh, work with uh, uh, the healthcare professionals and the healthcare professional associations that are important uh, players. <clears throat> the next one, I will skip the key recommendation, next one is my final one and the key recommendation I like to leave for the audience and also for discussion, to stimulate discussion, is th that uh, we need to look at the, the integration of maternal and newborn health and healthcare, taking a life course approach, not very focused on a particular specific moment in time, and that is possible only if we strengthen the primary health care system to deliver those essential interventions to all women, children, and adolescents, that that requires multi-sectoral collaboration, and also it requires the securing of financial investments by government and their parties, 
And here in the United States, there is obviously the critical aspects of how the government regulates and facilitates the access to services that you are currently discussing. Thank you very much for your attention and I really look forward to the discussion. Thank you so much, Dr. Boucher. We really appreciate you bringing the international perspective into our workshop. Uh, so thank you so much. Um, we will now turn to Ms. Latona Jiwa and she's going to be presenting on increasing access to quality community support for postpartum people. Thank you, Ms. Jiwa. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Latona Giwa. I am a nurse, doula, lactation consultant, and birth justice advocate. And I'm excited to talk to you all about accessing quality community support in the postpartum period. My only disclosure is that I am a member owner of Birthmark Doula Collective and the New Orleans Breastfeeding Center. We are a birth worker cooperative in New Orleans, Louisiana. And today we are going to cover some terminology, key evidence, example models, and gaps in research related to community support. I wanted to start with terminology because um, when it comes to birth workers, the, although these are roles that have always been around in our communities throughout history, we are in the United States and much of the world in a stage of professionalization, innovation, and adaptation to a dysfunctional healthcare system, meaning that many of the names and categories for our work are still being distilled, and there's sometimes overlap between these. So perinatal community health workers is a newer term. Um, we can also say birth workers. And overall, what's important to know is that these are not medical care providers, we are support providers in the perinatal period for families. Within that umbrella, doulas who have become well known are again support providers, not medical providers, providing informational, emotional, and physical support before, during, and after birth. Um, birth doulas are the most known and understood. There are also postpartum doulas that focus on the postpartum period, among many other types of doulas, such as abortion doulas and death doulas. There's also lactation professionals, nurse home visitors, peer and parent educators, among others. But today we're going to focus on our perinatal community health workers and doulas. Um, it's often useful to contrast the role of the nurse and the doula in the intrapartum period to understand the differences. I'm not going to go deep into this slide other than to say that they have very distinct roles, one clinical and one non-clinical, um, an advocate and supporter. And also that we've heard other presenters today say that um, doulas aren't the only solution to our maternal health care problem, and indeed we need all of these distinct roles working together in a team. Um, otherwise, that's an unfair burden on doulas to fix a very broken system. So, how is it that community-based perinatal support providers can positively impact perinatal health outcomes? We believe that there are three main reasons. One, in community-based care is simply more accessible care, especially in the postpartum period. Two, we have a greater duration of time and depth of relationship with birthing families than traditional maternal health care providers do. And three, we prioritize cultural appropriateness um, or cultural congruency and focus on addressing systemic racism. Um, and part of that is by employing people of lived experience from within client communities. So first, in terms of, um, in ter sorry, I'm seeing the chat, that was a pregnant belly. Um, in terms of the first one, in providing more accessible care, the idea here is going where the parents are. So instead of asking birthing families to leave their communities to go to hospitals, to go to the very sites of trauma and um, harmful care, we go to where they are. So um, 
in a 2014 study of uses of postpartum care predictors and barriers, um, families identified barriers in the postpartum period to care, such as I feel fine, I'm too busy with my baby, I have other things going on, or I don't need care. And researchers identified predictors of not accessing care related to class, family status, um, and previous care use. But community-based perinatal support programs can um, can address these access issues by meeting families where they are, whether that's through home visitation or um, agreed upon shared community locations such as libraries. A second piece is that we build trusting relationships by having a, spending a lot of time with our clients um, on in their communities. So um, studies show that birth doulas, for example, can spend up to nine times as many hours with their clients in the same perinatal period than traditional medical providers. So it's no surprise that birth doulas tend to build a deeper, more trusting relationship that can yield positive results. And this is just a visual of a typical doula care roadmap. And then community-based doulas do tend to focus on addressing systemic racism and have a focus on cultural congruency with their clients. This is a, a table from ACOG that shows disparities in obstetric and gynecological outcomes. And I've just highlighted two that birth doulas have consistently been shown to improve outcomes of, which are preterm birth and cesarean delivery rates, both of which black birthing families bear a disparate burden of. So birth doulas are not the only solution as we've talked about, but they are a key tool in addressing the systemic racism and health inequity of maternity health care. Um, and many organizations, including the American College of Nurse Midwives, have um, stated that evidence shows that greater racial diversity in health, our healthcare workforce improves access to care and the quality of care that people of color receive, and that this is an important intervention. I want to speak now about our program as an example. So my birth doula organization is a birth worker cooperative that was founded 12 years ago in New Orleans, Louisiana. We already we are a majority black woman organization serving all backgrounds of clients, but with a deep focus on impacting black birth disparities. We began simply with providing birth doula care to all who desired it, regardless of income on a sliding scale and slowly added additional services that we noted that our community was having difficulty accessing, such as educational classes and home lactation visits. We saw a lack of holistic care centering maternal mental health. And in 2020, we launched a perinatal community health worker program with funding to train a cohort of 12 community members in the combined skills of doula care, childbirth education, lactation, and maternal mental health support. These were all parents who demonstrated leadership in different ways in their communities and desired to go deeper in perinatal support. After a 14 week training, this cohort committed to a year of paid service with us in a variety of needed roles and several were eventually hired. For example, one PCHW became a full time on site doula at a local homeless shelter for pregnant and parenting teens an experience that she shared from her own teen parenting history. We believe that hiring from within the community of birthing people that we serve is a central part of our mission and our impact. So um, there is a great deal of evidence that shows that doula care improves several perinatal outcomes. We have seen um, significant decrease in cesarean birth rates, increase in spontaneous vaginal birth, decrease in use of pain medication, and some effect on the shortening duration of labor. Other studies have shown impacts such as decreasing rates of postpartum depression and sometimes increasing rates of breastfeeding as well. Additionally, um, more and more states are looking into piloting or running Medicaid pilots of doula care programs or reimbursing doula care through Medicaid. And studies of these models have shown 
fewer complications and deaths resulting from lower C-section rates, lower NICU admissions from preterm birth, and potential tremendous cost savings for these improvements as well. So all of that has led organizations like ACOG and others to say that continuous labor support by a doula is one of the most effective tools to improve labor and delivery outcomes. And here are some logos of many various local Louisiana community-based perinatal support programs in my area. And some of these are national models that folks might be familiar with. Some are statewide and some are hyper-local. And we are all trying to develop, implement, and improve the most effective quality perinatal support programs. And we do a lot of collaboration, cross-referral. We, when we have doula clients, typically they're also enrolled in one or two of these other programs as well. Um, and there are programs in my area also that collaborate with clinics, with physicians, midwives, nurse practitioners, and also there are attempts to make hospital-based doula programs in the area. So we know that there are many types of community-based perinatal support professionals and organizations, and that in general, this field is professionalizing, which is yielding to a lot of variety, um, but also a lot of opportunity to see improved impact. We know that there are an increasing number of active and integrated partnerships between hospital and clinical settings and community-based perinatal support programs, and um, as well as with Medicaid and many in the pilot stage. And we know that doulas and other community-based perinatal support programs have positive impact on perinatal outcomes, but studies have tended to focus on birth doulas as a general term and the intrapartum window, specifically the um, continuous labor support as the treatment or intervention. So they have tended to lack specificity about the many different types of community-based perinatal support professionals that exist, such as perinatal community health workers that have wider training or postpartum doulas, and they have lacked focus on the postpartum period and the interventions that take place in that window, such as postpartum home visitation and postpartum mental health screening. We know that social determinants of health, systemic racism, and provider bias negatively impact Black, Indigenous, and people of color birthing people, but studies have not tended to investigate the racial or cultural fit or congruency of the community-based perinatal support person with the birthing clients and the potential impact of that. So my recommendations today from my community-based experience are to one, increase research of doula care generally and specifically in the postpartum period. Um, postpartum doula care has yet to really be mapped and defined in the same ways that birth doula care has, and there haven't been as many studies of it. Provide, um, postpartum doula care can be provided by a birth doula in that postpartum window or by specific postpartum doulas or perinatal community health workers. I'm curious, what is the quantity and dose um, and quality of intervention that yields the most improved postpartum outcomes? I also recommend further study of integrated partnerships between traditional hospital clinical providers and community-based um, perinatal supporters. I would ask questions like, is there a difference in efficacy between hospital-based employee doula programs and independent community-based doula programs? Does it make a difference if the doula works just for the client or also for the institution that they're trying to change? I also recommend research that examines the impact of Medicaid reimbursement models on doula care's efficacy. What is the difference in efficacy between Medicaid reimbursed pilot doula programs and independent ones that do not seek reimbursement? Does Medicaid reimbursement shift care practices and is that shift positive or negative? And I'd like to see investigation of community-based perinatal support care providers' racial and cultural identities in relationship with the birthing person's racial and cultural identities and the impact of that cultural fit. 
does it impact the quality of care in the same way that it does for midwives and obstetricians? We should not assume that a doula is a doula is a doula, but also examine which types of doulas provide the greatest impact for the families who need it most. Thank you, everyone, and I'll put my contact info in the chat. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Ms. Chiwa. I hope you get a chance to check the chat. Actually, I was just going to say because there are so many comments about uh, the importance of doulas in postpartum care. Um, so thanks also to the audience for commenting. Okay, we have our last presentation of the day now uh, joint, to be made jointly uh, by Dr. Uh, Cross Barnett and Ms. Terry uh, on postpartum health uh, um, centers for Medicaid and Medicare care services initiatives and future steps. So I will turn it over to both of you and don't forget Thanks. your video. Thank you so much. I can't see myself, but I assume my video is on. I'm gonna drop a huge number of resources into the chat here, um, just that links to the models I'm gonna be talking about and the publications that we have out of one of them. So hopefully this goes through, um, we shall see. Uh, any case. Uh, so we're going to be talking about CMS initiatives uh, around postpartum health, specifically some projects from the Innovation Center and then the Maternity Care Action Plan for CMS. Next slide, please. So the three programs through the Innovation Center that have addressed issues around postpartum care are Strong Start for Mothers and Newborns, the Maternal Opioid Misuse or MOM model, and the Integrated Care for Kids model, which we call E. Um, so, Strong Start for Mothers and Newborns tested three different models of maternity care, uh, midwife-led care and birth centers, uh, group prenatal care, and uh, maternity care homes, which were basically a care coordination model. And then the other two models are testing ways of integrating care, uh, one specifically for people who are pregnant with or postpartum with an opioid use disorder, and the other one for children or pregnant adults. Next slide, please. So the prenatal, the postpartum visit is really a bridge between prenatal care and primary care. And as we know, some people are not eligible for Medicaid until they become pregnant. Um, and so they haven't necessarily been engaged with the healthcare system. And they may have a lot of issues that they had either before they came into prenatal care or issues that emerged or were exacerbated by pregnancy that require significant postpartum follow-up. But if people don't come to a postpartum visit, then it's really hard to follow up with them, make sure that they're getting the referrals that they need, get to them to those places, assess what still needs care, and so on and so forth. So I wanted to investigate some of what we've learned about helping people access that care. Next slide, please. So in Strong Start for Mothers and Newborns, and by the way, um, Dr. Marcel's uh, birth center was part of Strong Start for Mothers and Newborns. And if you go on our website and look at the evaluation report, you can see the specific results from her birth center, which were just stunningly amazing. Um, and I'm going to make a few of the same, some of the same points that, that she did actually, as we go through here. Um, so I think really affirming what she has been talking about, about the midwifery model being really ideal for serving Medicaid participants in an appropriate way. Next slide. So what some of the main barriers that we noted to postpartum visits are here, and I wanted to highlight two of them in particular. So one of them is provider discontinuity. So if you are a, a, mom, you know, a new parent, you've just had a baby, and you're going to go see a provider who you don't know at all, or who you barely know, or who um, you know, maybe you had an unpleasant birth experience that that person was involved with, or whatever it is, there's, and you're not feeling terrible, there's not a lot of incentive for you to go out with a newborn especially in bad weather or if you don't have good transportation um, for a visit that might last five to ten minutes. So that's a really huge uh, barrier to postpartum care. And we saw that across the group care model because unlike um, Elevate, it, the, we mostly were testing centering pregnancy, which doesn't have a specific postpartum component, um, and in the care coordination models. The birth center models, which did have better care continuity and uh, did have more visits, longer visits, um, had very, very high postpartum visit attendance. Um, in Medicaid in general, postpartum visit attendance is under 60%. And in some areas, it's as low as 25%. 
So it's a really, really big issue getting people into that care. Um, you know, we see a lot of other things here, but transportation and childcare are also huge issues for people. Places that welcome people a lot easier for people who can bring transportation. You have a robust transportation system. You can see here in this picture, which was taken um, by a provider in in our Inc model uh, that in the Bronx, that you can see that this person is having a lot of trouble managing the subway stairs with her stroller. So it's not just you know, it's not just in rural areas or suburban areas where people run into these problems where they have a lot of trouble with transit. Next slide, please. So, so some of the things that we found were effective strategies for encouraging people to attend their postpartum visits were having that kind of provider continuity and relationship building, um, enhanced education and services so that people understood the importance of the postpartum visit, what would happen there, why you know, they would need to come and what would, you know, what people could do for them at that visit. And then home visits, uh, which many of the birth centers offered were also highly effective. Our birth centers offered a minimum of four postpartum visits and usually at least one of them, uh, especially the early one was in, at the home. Uh, early scheduling could help. So if the postpartum visit was scheduled prenatally or during the birth episode at the hospital uh, using uh, texting and other forms of outreach uh, and for making sure that there was transportation assistance available, welcoming children, offering some kind of postpartum gift, which could just be something very simple like baby footprints on a certificate uh, or a shower for a group of people and payment incentives for providers. So uh, making sure they understood the importance of making sure that their patients came back. Next slide, please. But I think one of the things that some of the other folks um, today have pointed out is how important it is to look at the system and not just be focused on each individual beneficiary. So in thinking about what do we do about systemic change, uh, enhancing continuity across our prenatal care system is really important. Making sure people know their providers, develop trust in the system, to have that chance to develop that mutual respect. Um, that there's sufficient time for the visits to be meaningful, that there are location and time flexibilities, that uh, telehealth is a really good option for some people, that you can offer one-stop shopping so there are co-located services. You're not uh, setting up a care coordination program that takes a, a busy, stressed out person with transportation and childcare difficulties and then sends them to 15 places to try and get what they need. Uh, that there's our financial incentives and uh, accountability for the healthcare systems themselves, that we build a workforce that includes uh, more robust midwifery care, more robust community health worker and doula resources and lactation resources, and that we're really focused on taking a patient-centered approach in the care itself. So next slide, please. I also wanted to share some lessons from our integrated care for kids and maternal opioid misuse models that show some of the issues with keeping that continuity of care going during the postpartum period. Next slide, please. So one of the issues is that there's very, very poor data sharing. And sharing of data among uh, providers and systems can be critical for continuity, um, can be critical for mitigating um, patient responsibility and risk. So rather than the patient having to tell each of their providers what's going on, what the other provider did, what the other provider said, uh, you know, that all of that information could be centralized. Some people may have a condition that's being treated in multiple systems and the providers really need to be able to communicate. Um, for instance, someone with a behavioral health issue might also be seeing a maternity care provider and a primary care provider and maybe some other specialist provider for a different condition. And there needs to be medication reconciliation and a knowledge of the barriers that that person might be facing because of the stress that they're under. Um, and then. This is a big issue with alternatives for phone and email. Uh, we heard a lot, especially in Strong Start, actually, that people didn't answer their phones. And our question was, well, then why do you keep calling them, you know, instead of figuring out a different system for trying to reach them? Next slide, please. So some of the barriers to actually doing effective data sharing and integration of information in order to better serve clients include uh, the fact that almost all systems have their own electronic health records. There's a lack of alternative data sharing platforms, such as health information exchanges. 
Even when things like health information exchanges exist, there's often a lack of dedicated staff who can respond to the information sharing requests or in enter information into that shared platform. I think we all know that providers are already really stressed and busy, and every time we add something to their plates, we're actually depriving them of the opportunity to build better relationships with their patients. Uh, and so there's, and there's a time and resource challenge for developing data use agreements. There are real or perceived legal barriers to information sharing. There have actually been a lot of loosening of those regulations with the ACA and some other work that SAMHSA has done. Um, but when institutions are afraid of data sharing, you know, because of legal reasons, they're always going to say no. Um, you know, they're never going to take the risk of saying yes if they're not sure. And there are also privacy concerns from patients, especially people who might have undocumented folks in their households or families, people who have had interactions with the criminal justice system, or people who've had involvement or are afraid of CPS. Um, and a lot of people who are in various federal programs just feel like they're under a lot of surveillance to begin with and aren't particularly trustful of having their information shared across systems. Next slide, please. Uh, so I just wanted to show this example again. Uh, this is another uh, photo that a provider in our INC program gave us to show the complicated route that one parent had to take to get herself and her children all over New Haven to all the places that they needed to go. And you can see, you know, that they're all over town, that there are multiple stops, that there are, you know, that they're, the person informed us that they're not on a bus route. And so you have this person who doesn't just have to get to a postpartum appointment or other appointments that she might need to attend, but also ha has a new baby, and then also may have older children who need help, may have other relatives, may have a job. And as again, if they don't have a car, you're really referring them to nowhere when you make a referral because they have no capacity to get there. And even if you provide a, a transportation source, again, if somebody has you know, 15 different places to go, it's not a very practical solution. Next slide, please. There's also the importance of relationships and trust, and this has a lot to do with the provider continuity. Next slide, please. This is a photo a peer recovery coach gave us in the mom evaluation that she posed to show us uh, the stigma that a parent who is pregnant with an opioid use disorder might experience. So this is the idea that her children are, are judging her for not being a good enough mom, you know, or for not being able to get better on her own. Um, and the peer recovery coach was pointing out that when people have struggled with this kind of substance abuse in the community, they feel so judged in their own homes, they feel that they're worried about being judged by others out in the world who are providing services to them. And every time they go to a new provider, they're taking that risk of being judged, of being stigmatized, of being blamed for any problems that their families have. And any time they meet a provider who does stigmatize them, they're then afraid of seeing another provider. So really critical to make sure that we're putting people where they are, building that kind of trust. And as somebody was saying before, not, you know, Does it appear that we've lost her? I think we have, but she was right at the yeah. end. Um, <laughs> so um, I will transition us to the next section quickly of our presentation. Okay. Wonderful. Next slide, please. Um, so while well, Caitlin uh, just talked about the importance of, you know, all of the lessons learned that we have, uh, you know, accumulated uh, through the CMS Innovation Center, models. Um, I want to talk about now how we are using that to inform policy across CMS. Um, so to start, just uh, as context, um, addressing the maternity care crisis in our country is a key priority for the Biden-Harris administration. In uh, December 2021, Vice President Kamala Harris convened the first ever uh, Federal Maternal Health Day of Action, where she announced this historic call to action to improve maternal health outcomes across the United States. And then in June 2022, earlier this year, the White House released a blueprint uh, for addressing the maternal health crisis, which describes the administration's whole of government approach to improving maternal health 
and addressing persistent inequities in maternal health outcomes. And from that body of work uh, has created uh, now this, uh, we have now created this CMS Maternity Care Action Plan. So next slide. Um, the, you know, the idea is that as a result of that White House blueprint, CMS has taken a holistic look at its policies, programs, and really focused on opportunities to enhance maternity care delivered to enrollees, whether they be in Medicare, Medicaid, CHIP, or the health insurance marketplaces. And the action plan is really intended to develop um, uh, you know, a coordinated approach across all of the CMS components um, to identify gaps and to focus on strategies that improve health outcomes, reduce the inequities um, for people during pregnancy, childbirth, and the postpartum period. And so the action plan is really built on the promising practices that we have learned over time, the lessons learned that the Innovation Center um, has uh, led on maternal health that Caitlin just talked about, um, and from beneficiary experiences. And it really spans all of the areas that you see here in the diagram. So I'm gonna just briefly focus on those elements that touch on um, opportunities in postpartum health. Next slide. So to start off, um, people have great difficulty getting care. If they can't get coverage. I think we all know that. Um, so Medicaid is working to help states expand coverage to at least a full year postpartum to allow for follow-up care and ongoing treatment for chronic conditions, as well as standard primary care access. Um, those who you know, develop pregnancy-related healthcare conditions may need ongoing follow-up, um, whether that be shorter-term needs, such as treating anemia or other needs that um, may become chronic, such as uh, diabetes, hypertension, or depression. And so we really are looking at the strategies that you see here um, on the screen, um, really as part of the opportunity to move forward, guaranteed access to Medicaid, for a year after uh, pregnancy, reducing gaps in coverage for postpartum um, people. Um, really, um, we are looking at the levers that we have through policy, technology, and operations, and how they can work better to help postpartum period uh, people understand their coverage options. Um, for example, if they lose uh, eligibility for Medicaid coverage and help them transition to, for example, marketplace coverage. And then special programs like our um, Connecting Kids to Coverage um, uh, funding opportunity that was announced earlier this year with really the, the goal of making sure that um, Medicaid and CHIP coverage um, is identified for people who are eligible. Um, next slide. Um, so, uh, you know, a second uh, key area is improving access. If more beneficiaries need care, then we have to have the providers that can offer that care. So CMS is working with states and, you know, sister agencies in the federal government to identify opportunities to expand and really improve access to a diverse maternity care workforce, including midwives, community-based practitioners, doulas, community health workers, um, and really, um, you know, our view is that expanding and diversifying the maternity care workforce can increase access to both maternity care and routine gynecological care. And so this is part of our focus. State Medicaid programs can cover community-based maternity services, um, such as those delivered by doulas, community health workers, and we want to continue to support that. Next slide. Um, so, finally, uh, we also want to ensure providers understand patient needs um, uh, and that we are encouraging providers to participate in quality improvement and measurement outcomes. And so, making sure that we are focusing on providing tools for social needs screening, um, like the tool that we released in conjunction with our accountable health communities model. Um, that really helps uh, providers and community resources identify um, social uh, uh, needs and uh, make referrals and collect data um, to have maternal and infant health initiatives. 
um, to really focus on improving policies and implementing evidence-based practices, and then making sure that as we think about our overarching quality strategy, that we are focused um, in particular beginning on 2024 on a requirement that states re report a set of quality measures related to children's health, including measures around uh, a maternity care core set. So I'm going to uh, pass it back to Caitlin if she's back on um, just to close us out. Next slide. And she may still Caitlin, we have about we have about one minute left. I'm so yep. sorry to rush you both, but we want the panel to have just a couple minutes for questions. No problem. We can just move us forward then. Um, just yeah, to the just go to the slide. next slide. Yeah. Uh, I was yeah. just going to say. Oh, did we not have our equity slide? We were just going to talk a little bit about equity being a real priority for us right now in um, in these studies in looking at what helps. Certainly, in Strong Start, we saw excellent in, um, improvement in care uh, about for the birth center model among all uh, racial ethnic groups that were served. Uh, so that we had some pretty strong evidence there for the midwifery model of care, and we are tracking equitable outcomes within the uh, mom and the ink models and just wanted to emphasize how important that is to our work right now at the innovation center. So we thank uh, our contractors, our CMMI colleagues. <laughs> um, and thank you to both of you. We appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, over to you, Dr. Davidson. And just a reminder, we're bringing back all speakers now in this session, starting with Dr. Saldana. So thank you so much again to all of the speakers. And I'll just take a second to let you get your um, uh, back up on video. Um, I, I know it's been a long day, but um, there's, as you can probably see and will see when we send it to you, there's been very spirited uh, chat comments and questions um, uh, that have been posted. Um, as we wrap up, uh, can I first ask if any of the independent um, panel members have any questions or comments that they'd like to raise for this latest workshop? I'm just pausing for a moment in case someone's struggling with getting their mute off. I think the, the last uh, uh, comment sums it up well. It says, thank you all. It was a perfect oral presentation. Um, so I think uh, there have been many kudos um, that have been happening in, in the chat. Um, with that, I think I'd like to thank everyone for um, the incredibly impactful amount of information and um, uh, persuasion about the many faceted areas that we have to transform in order to correct this injustice. Um, uh, a couple of quick reminders, day three um, starts tomorrow. Uh, can I have the independent panel members and ODP stay on the line and we'll be moved into a practice session. And for everyone else, have a great evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Goodbye.